Post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you. It's 3 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dalby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. And what a show I've got for you today. First up, we've got our world exclusive interview with Donald Trump. And he's got a real warning for Prince Harry. Stand by for that when Trump met Farage. Exclusive clip at 4 p.m. Plus, the man himself, Nigel Farage. Next up, Harry's brother has been out and about in Yorkshire today, but all the talk is about his wife. And it's another tough day for Rishi Sunak. Aren't they all at the moment as Rishi battles to get the Rwanda bill passed once again? He's also got some of his fellow Tory MPs looking to replace him once again. And that's all coming up in your next hour. So welcome to the show. Always an absolute pleasure to have your company. I want to hear from you today. Email the usual ways, gbviews at gbnews.com. This sit down. Nigel Farage with Donald Trump. It's explosive. At 4 p.m., we've got the clip where Donald Trump talks about NATO. You recall he's telling the other members to pull up their socks, cough up 2% of their GDP. Well, you will not want to miss what he has to say. And that's only here. GB News, 4 p.m., we've got that ahead of Nigel Farage's exclusive sit down at 7 p.m. Tons to get stuck into today. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sophia West. Thanks, Martin. Good afternoon. It's one minute past three. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Former US President Donald Trump has hinted he could deport Prince Harry if he wins the election. In an exclusive interview with Nigel Farage, he said the Duke of Sussex won't get special privileges if he lied on his visa about drug use. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Mm, you would. But I thought they were very disrespectful to the family, to mm. the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I thought the Queen was incredible. 
And you can see that full interview with former US President Donald Trump on Farage tonight from 7 p.m. Now, the first person to be convicted of cyber flashing in England and Wales has been jailed for 66 weeks. 39-year-old Nicholas Hawke sent unsolicited explicit photos to a teenager and a woman. The Justice Secretary described the offence as a distressing crime which can't be normalised and said the sentence sends a clear message that the behaviour was, has severe consequences. Britain faces a 1979 moment, the Shadow Chancellor will say in a speech as Labour seeks to bring about a new chapter in Britain's economic history. Addressing finance leaders this evening, Rachel Reeves will liken the challenge waiting the next government that faced by Margaret Thatcher. She's made it clear she plans to reform the Treasury if Labour wins a general election. Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Darren Jones, outlined her plan. We are on the cusp of an opportunity in this country, an opportunity for a decade of national renewal where we can get growth back into our economy, make people better off um, and start to turn the page on 14 years of failure from the Conservatives. If Labour is to win the election later this year, uh, it will be the worst fiscal inheritance that any party's had since the Second World War. And that's why we talk about a decade of national renewal. There will be some things we can do immediately and public services are obviously one of our priorities. The First Minister of Wales has faced questions in the Senate for the final time before sending his resignation to the King. Mark Drakeford is officially stepping down after five years on the job. He'll be succeeded by Vaughan Gething, who's set to become the first black leader of a European country. Mark Drakeford was asked by the leader of the Welsh Conservatives, Andrew R.T. Davies, what advice he'd give to his successor. Up, I'm afraid, hours and hours uh, of his time. <laughs> Uh, because it's uh, unavoidable that if you come here and you can be asked a question, not simply any question on the brief you happen to hold, but any question on... Road in the same way. No. A breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A report found just 47% of local road miles were rated as being in a good condition, with 36% adequate and 17% poor. The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils are expected to fix 2 million potholes in the current financial year. That's up 43% on the previous year and the highest annual total since 2015. Pothole campaigner Mark Morrill wants to see the government invest in road repairs. I don't accept there's no money. They find money for things that they want to spend on the, you know, me and you disagree on HS2. I mean, £66 billion to the real road check that won't go in central London, never, to up to Birmingham, when our roads networks are failing. To me, it's like putting an extension on our got subsidence. But there's loads of examples where government can find money where it wants to, but it's not a priority for them. Um, you know, on the other side, every time you have a repair on your vehicle, because they get 20% VAT, don't they? And the Prince of Wales is visiting housing initiatives in Sheffield today to promote his homelessness project. The outing comes after the Princess of Wales was filmed smiling while out shopping for the first time since her operation in January. The Sun has now published pictures and a video of Princess Catherine with Prince William, who were at a farm shop in Windsor on Saturday. It follows weeks of social media speculation surrounding her health and whereabouts. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Martin. Thank you, Sophia. Now we've got so much to get through today. Let's get our tea stuck into the show. But of course, there's only one place to start. And that's that Nigel Farage exclusive interview with Donald Trump. And Trump's warned Prince Harry that he could be kicked out of America if he becomes president again. Harry, of course, is being investigated over whether or not he lied in his visa application after admitting in his autobiography spare that he'd previously taken drugs. Might come back to bite him on the bum. And Trump spoke to Nigel Farage about how Harry and Meghan's behaviour affected the late Queen. Uh, she, you know, I would say, although she wouldn't show it because she was strong and smart, mm. but I would imagine they broke her heart. The things that they were saying were so bad and so horrible. And uh, she was in her 90s and hearing this stuff. I think they broke her heart. No, think, it was horrible. I think they it really hurt her very badly. But if he's, if he's lied on his visa form, 
You know, doesn't doesn't, know. doesn't the truth need to come out? We'll have I to. mean, should, should he get special privileges that nobody else does? No, and we'll have to see. Uh, if they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in America. Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Mm, you would. But I thought they were very disrespectful to the family, to mm. the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I thought the Queen was incredible. I mean, think of it. All those years, 75 years, she, she's almost never made a mistake. Right. It's, it's, okay. it's almost unbelievable. Believe me, you will not want to miss this. Nigel Farage's exclusive interview with President-elect Donald Trump will be live on GB News from 7 o'clock this evening. It's going to be a rip snorter. Now, I'll have lots more from Donald Trump later in this show. And I'll also speak live to Nigel Farage himself at around half past four. You can very relax poolside in sunglasses earlier. <laughs> but now to the latest on the government's attempts to send migrants to Rwanda. The latest attempts round and round we go. And Downing Street has said the House of Lords has the opportunity to work with the government and stop people smuggling after the Commons overturned amendments to the Rwanda bill. Well, the parliamentary showdown over the flagship bill will continue once again tomorrow when peers may once again seek to press for changes to the proposed legislation. Well, I'm joined now in our studio in Westminster by our political editor, Christopher Hope, and the Independent's chief political commentator, John Rental. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Hello, Chris, Martin. let's start with you. We've been here before. It's Groundhog Day. Round and round we go. More ping pong than a youth club. Will this ever <laughs> get through? Well, nearly two years ago, these plans first emerged and it when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister. So, so two PMs ago and nearly two years ago, we've been discussing this Rwanda plan. It looks like we're getting towards the end game. The, the, last night, 10 changes or, or waterings down, to, to quote what the government might think about it, were, were debated and reversed to the Rwanda bill. It's now back with the House of Lords. It's called Ping Pong in the world. We, me and John and you work in, Martin, where there's Ping Pong between the Commons and the Lords. It should be reversed again and back to the Commons to probably to overturn a few more tomorrow night. We could have royal assent on Thursday. And then the real battle might start because lots of uh, lawyers are sharpening their legal quills to try and use or find holes in this new legislation to stop a cohort of maybe 200 or so asylum seekers who have been contacted by the Home Office already and told to be on the first flights. So we're getting towards the end game. We heard from Labour yesterday. They got their plan for a thousand strong uh, renewals and enforcement group. And that might that's their, their idea. And you were saying you, you thought it was quite a good idea idea and might, might work, but this is going to cost, I mean, you know, a couple of million pounds per per migrant to be sent to Rwanda in the early stages. Yeah, which in itself is like a lottery win for each of them. Perhaps the same legal quills will be sharpened as were put on ice after the Brexit referendum. It does feel, as I keep saying, like history repeating itself, the Lords frustrating the will of the Commons, frustrating the will of yeah. the people. Round and round we go. But this is normal. I mean, I think Brexit was different with the Supreme Court ruling against the attempt to uh, well, the, the fact of proving that the, the Parliament by Jacob rees mogg as leader of the House. That is different. This is the normal run of things. You have controversial uh, bills which are frustrated by the Lords. That's what happens. I asked in a lobby meeting today with the House with the PM spokesman, do, do you feel that the, there's no right to do it for the House of Lords? And the number 10 backed off. No, it's what they do. But equally, I think the idea that uh, the elected tribunes of the people shall have the final say is, is how it works. This simply is how it works. OK, John, let's bring you in now. What a pantomime. <laughs> well, I mean, no, it's, it's, it's how the British... Con as, as, as Chris said, it's how the British Constitution works. Uh, but the question is whether the, whether, the, whether the Lords are prepared to push it a bit further than they normally would do. I mean, the, conv the convention is that, is that Labour peers would accept... After they've made their point, they would accept the, 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 the will of the elected House. But this time, they, many of them feel so strongly about it that they might be prepared to go for a few more pings and a few more pongs. Mm. And the thing is, half a billion pounds has been spent on it already. Not a single person <coughs> has taken off. Chris has famously got a bet with Rishi Sunak for a single pint of beer that one of them won't take off. I think your beer is safe. <laughs> Do you think Chris's beer is safe? Will this ever, literally and metaphorically, get off the ground? Well, it's a very finely balanced question, isn't it? Because, I mean, in the end, I mean, I think what's going to be decisive with, with Labour peers is that they don't want to appear to be blocking this policy because it is the policy of the elected, mm. uh, the elected government, but it might be blocked by the courts. I mean, that's what uh, 
uh, that is that is much more likely to happen. Mm. Uh, but if the flights do get off, then you know Labour's going to be in a in a problem. They're mm. going to have a big problem at the election campaign because they're going to be they're going to be saying, as Yvette Cooper has said. They will mm. reverse the policy. They will abolish it, even well, even if people are already. What going. does success look like? Is the question. If you get into thousands of people taking off, mm. that is success. Well, no, success, Hundreds success, isn't success, success is whether it has a deterrent effect yes, on, also, on the on the small boats crossing. the And channel. the weather could have as big a bearing as, as the Rwanda plan. Well, yeah. indeed, you'd be better off doing a rain dance, probably, <laughs> on the White Cliffs of Dover. <laughs> but joking aside, um, is it Rwanda or bust now for Rishi? I mean, he seems to have put all of his eggs in this basket, mm. and in that sense. The opposition, the Lords, they'll be joined up thinking, they'll be joined up voting to absolutely try and frustrate this. And if it is the bust option, that brings into question His this future. leadership challenge. He's running out of road, isn't he? Mm. And everything he's tried hasn't worked. You can look back to the autumn statement last year, the conference speech, that was the big one last October. Then we had the King speech in November. Then we had the autumn statement in the spring, the spring budget last week. That's, you know, that's the four things in about seven months. Nothing has moved the dial. He's cut national insurance attacks no one discusses by 4% in, in about three months, in, jet, in two points in January and now come up in April. Nothing's happening. He's lifting pensioners by £900 on, on the state pensions. He's cutting up that tax by £900. Nothing is working. And, I, and there's frustration now in Parliament. I didn't believe the rumours about him being replaced mm. <clears throat> until yesterday morning when normally sane people were coming up to me and saying <laughs> he, might, he might be off you this mean... week. There could be as many as 40 letters of no confidence gone in um, and only 53 were required. There was a meeting last night at one of the so-called five families, 45-minute yeah. meeting, a dozen Tory MPs. They spoke only about how how to and whether the PM should be replaced. I think John was laughing there because the, the notion there might be some normally sane people well, in no, the Chris, Chris, Chris was, was essentially suggesting that it is insane to try to, try to remove the I Prime think Minister to viewers and listeners point. outside the, the, the room is, we're in, it is no, it is, it is. It is bonkers, I think, to, to use the technical term. Uh, and I, I, mean, I don't believe there are, are as many as, 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 as Chris is suggesting who, who actually think this is, this is a workable idea. But I Rishi, just don't think it's going to happen. Rishi is meeting the 1922 committee tomorrow yeah. evening, I believe, and that's when I guess some, some more no, no detail might be laid down. But I guess the question is this. Are the Conservatives in such a precarious position, they know that the iceberg is coming and the captain at the helm might be stable, but being stable at the bottom of the sea is no use. No, is, it, they, is it time to change no, the captain? No, no, but they know that trying to change the captain would, would only make it worse, would only make things worse. And, uh, you know, I mean, maybe I talk to the wrong uh, sort of Conservative MPs because, uh, because, because the ones I tend to speak to are One Nation moderates who rather admire Rishi Sunak. They're a bit disappointed with him and they think, you know, it hasn't gone very well, but they think yeah. it would be worse if they tried to get rid of it. If you're hurtling towards a cliff face and you mm. can change direction by grabbing a steering wheel and you've done it before twice, why not try it a third time? Well, because that? it hasn't worked twice. It's made it worse mm. every time. So, well, then if you're yeah. going to crash anyway, I mean, so there's an idea, this is called the Contract with Britain plot, yeah. which well, I discussed previously on GB News, to bring in Penny Mordaunt. It's based on the Newt Gingrich idea in 1994, when he had to give 100 days in power and election straight yeah. after. That's the, idea, that's the idea to bring in Penny Mordaunt. Didn't work for the for the uh, Republicans it, in, it did uh, in the midterms. Actually, it <laughs> <did> <laughs> in the midterms. <laughs> not in '96. I use a Titanic metaphor. You went Thelma and Louise, <laughs> but great stuff. And today the polling, uh, polling is polling, but a record deficit now. Labour ahead by 26 points. John in a Redfield poll, they put on five points. The Tories have dropped three. Reform bubbling away on 14. Yeah, no, the, poll, the, the opinion polls are terrible. But, I mean, to take issue with what Chris was saying earlier, you know, yes, nothing has worked so far, but, you know, four pence in the pound off, off tax, whatever it's called, national insurance or income tax, uh, it, I think that is going to... People are going to feel the benefit of that eventually. Yeah. I mean, it hasn't happened... Half of it hasn't happened yet. Uh, the economy is, is improving. Uh, earnings are rising faster than prices. Uh, the sun might even shine this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and people might start to feel better off. And yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, yeah, nothing can be taken for granted. I mean, the opinion polls could just go on getting mm. worse. But I think, I think there's plenty of time now for, mm. for a cycle where journalists are so bored with this story of just everything getting worse that as soon as things start, start to look, look a bit better, mm. there might be a big uh, mood shift. It could well be. Let's talk, if we could, briefly about Donald Trump sitting there with Nigel Farage. And what's interesting about that is that Donald Trump has said to Nigel that 
he will only sit down with Nigel. He won't sit down with any other British media outlets. Not even you, Martin. Not even me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm getting a highlight clip later on. I wonder if that will fuel this kind of rhetoric that he only talks to, to the echo chamber, or is this a significant moment where, as a guest, you know, Nigel will call them, the establishment media don't get access well, to Donald Trump, and therefore we're seeing a tipping point in, in who controls access to, to the f for future presidents. Well, possibly, and I think that raises a very interesting question for British politics about the effects of the American election campaign yeah. on on the British campaign, which which could well be happening at about the same time. I mean, if there's if we, if if mm. our election campaign is in October for a November election, or even for for late October, mm. uh, then you know Donald Trump is going to be on our, our on our TV screens mm. throughout our own election campaign. And the interesting question is. Who does that help? Does it help? Uh, does it help Rishi Sunak or does it help uh, Keir Starmer? It will certainly probably be a lot more interesting. Um, yes. States like that thing, because at least they have a binary choice where we seem to be muddling our way through. What do you make of the this notion that Trump is he's talking about NATO to us today? And yeah. you know, it's explosive what he's saying. He's basically saying, I don't want to give it away, but it's time to cough up. Mm. You know, member states. You've been getting away with paying less than two percent of your GDP all along, and he's rattling his sabre yeah. very, very loudly. He's not even in the White House yet. <laughs> he might not even get in there. But if he does, are we going to enter into a, a new sort of you know, anarchic, yeah. unpredictable form of politics, which actually is incredibly exciting? Well, you called him the president-elect, didn't you, earlier in your yeah. intro? And of course, he's not yet. Yeah. But he's, he's well, feel, there's but a feeling of momentum behind. The book his, isn't the, paid out on it. Well, you have that already. <laughs> and, and there's a feeling of momentum, momentum behind his candidacy. And it worked, the, the issue of two percent of GDP on, on, uh, on defence spending it was like two or three countries, I yes. think, when he was president. We are one of them. And now it's like maybe half, I think. But mm. they, they were trying to find... There are new numbers coming out from NATO all the time. Yeah, I think America uh, voters will love this, the fact that the, the EU, EU countries were forced to pay their, pay their own way, finally. And, John, mm. um, in terms of, like, you, obviously you work for the Independent, uh, an organ not particularly enamoured with Donald Trump <laughs> ever in any capacity. No. If Donald Trump was to get back to the White House, what would it mean for... What we say that the sort of liberal voters of well, the, the world. Well, this is what I mean about the impact he might have on our politics during the election campaign, because I mean he will he will rile up uh, Labour voters, um, mm. uh, no, no question about it. And um, it, you know, given that he's actually extremely unpopular with with British voters generally, I mean even Tory, Tories. If he is, um, I think uh, I think I think there's a question mark about whether he would. Whether whether anti-Trumpism would 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 help Labour, or whether people would feel that you know he's such a, a destabilising influence in the mm. world that they would want to cling to the to the incumbent. But, 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 I, I've been told to move on. I want to get one quick question out of you. How could could Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, work with Donald Trump? Mm. Well, with immense difficulty. I mean, it's going to be awkward. Um, you know, we saw. Uh, uh, David Lammy, his his shadow foreign secretary, his big mates but, with with but Blair and Biden. Bush. I mean, you, 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 George Bush and, did, and that didn't and, end very well. Chris. Well, they got on. They, they shared the same toothpaste for a bit. I mean, there was a bit. There was a time when they got on well, wasn't it? Didn't do didn't do Tony Blair a lot of good in the end. That. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. I'm being told to move on. John Rental, Chris Hope, excellent start to the show. Thank you very much indeed. Now, it's time now for the Great British Giveaway. We've got a shopping spree, a garden gadget bundle, and 12,345 quid, one, two, three, four, five pounds in cash, tax-free. And here's all the details for you to get your hands on that Wonga. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 
Great sort of frilly boots. Now, after so much talk about Princess Kate, a photo of her out and about at the weekend has been published, as you can see there. But has it dampened down the speculation? Not on your Nelly. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, I of course, them. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they commit a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. For the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to use if you it. Commit, there's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you... The no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy... that's an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. The time is 3.26. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, later in the show, I'll be joined by not one, but two former Bond girls. After the next man to set to play, the famous spy has been identified today. You will not want to miss that. Now, even by the Royals' extraordinary standards, it's been quite a dramatic few days, hasn't it? Yeah, there's been an incredible amount of speculation about Princess Kate's health, but she was photographed visiting a farm shop with Prince William in the Windsor area over the weekend. Meanwhile, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's profiles have been significantly shortened on the royal family's website. Well, there's so much to dive, dive into there. Let's speak to our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker, who's in Sheffield. Cameron, always a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Before we get stuck into that juicy menu, why are you in Sheffield? What's happening? 
Yeah, well, Prince William has been out and about focusing on his work, despite that photograph on the front page of The Sun this morning. And it's all to do with his Homewards projects, which he launched last year. Six flagship locations across the country, which will be blueprints demonstrating that homelessness can be ended within five years. Sheffield is one of those locations. And today he, he unveiled two brand new commitments, one from a DIY store, home base, which obviously is across the country, £1 million, pounds, providing 1500s what's been described as home starter kits so that's providing things like paint flooring furniture trying to make a house a home because it's thought if a uh, place is more homely then the chances of uh, becoming homeless again are far less likely the second commitment which Prince William was talking about today uh, was one from landlords in Sheffield uh, demonstrating that people at risk of homelessness right now can get housed because across this city 4,000 individuals or families are, uh, have registered with the city council uh, that they are homeless. That's an increase of 500 from last year. It's a new record. And Prince William told people today he wants to ease pressure on councils with his new uh, project, Homewards. It's a five-year commitment, so we're not really going to see any impact right now. It's still in the early stages, but there's certainly a lot of hope, a lot of talk, a lot of planning. Whether that translates into impact, we'll have to wait and see. Now, Cameron, I understand Prince William got a cheer, a round of applause when he arrived today. And it's probably because people are supporting the royal family in bigger numbers than ever. Because, you know, poor old Princess Kate has been hounded left, right and centre. Let's talk now about this video of her spotted out and about. Seems to be in rude health. Yeah, he certainly did. Prince William had a warm reception here. There was a cute kind of anecdote about uh, his wife, Catherine, as well, saying that early childhood is certainly her thing. Uh, but the video, I think, two minds, really. One, clearly, it was a slight invasion of the princess's privacy, but I, it appears Kensington Palace aren't too bothered about it because of what it has done is really quashed the speculation about the Princess of Wales's health. It's been complete hysteria online over the last couple of weeks, which com with complete unfounded concern conspiracy theories, A, about Kate and B, about the King. And although it's just a short 10, 12 second clip taken by a member of the public, it clearly shows the Princess of Wales alive and well, carrying her shopping, having done a, been gone through abdominal surgery over a few months with her husband, Prince William, by her side. They disappeared by a back gate back into Windsor Castle's uh, grounds into their Adelaide cottage. So it appears it's all good from William and Catherine's point of view, and she will be going going back uh, on public duties after Easter. And Cameron, even with that video coming out, a huge amount of speculation. Is it real? American media saying it's not, but it has been through software. It proves that is the princess. Can we quickly talk about the Sussexes? Seems they're being slowly airbrushed from reality, at least on the royal website. Yeah, it was a bit of confusion about a, an, an hour last night where the Duke and Duchess of Sussex completely removed from the royal website. I think at one point even Kate was. So we're all talking about what on earth is going on with the royal family's individual bios. On the website, royal sources tell me it's completely down to routine website maintenance. They're all back now, but Harry and Meghan have been downgraded. They used to have separate bios, which are quite lengthy. Now they're combined at the bottom of the web page, and it's a very short bio, very similar to what's happened to Prince Andrew, so it does look like they've been downgraded and, of course, they're no longer working members of the royal family. Yeah, thank you very much, Cameron Walker. The Sussexes' career going downhill faster than that bobsleigh you had on your screen there. Cameron Walker, live in Sheffield. Always an absolute pleasure. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and 4 o'clock and we'll cross live to Glasgow, where police officers are being told to target actors and comedians under Scotland's new hate crime laws. What an absolute joke. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Martin. It's 3.31. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your top story this hour. Former US President Donald Trump has hinted he could deport Prince Harry if he wins the election. In an exclusive interview with Nigel Farage, he said the Duke of Sussex won't get special privileges if he lied on his visa about drug use. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean... Not staying oh, in I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. 
And you can see that full interview on Farage tonight from 7pm. And the first person in England and Wales to be convicted of cyber flashing has been jailed. Nicholas Hawkes was sentenced to 66 weeks for sending unsolicited explicit photos to a teenager and a woman. The 39-year-old from Basildon in Essex. From Basildon in Essex was already a convicted sex offender when he sent the images. And the Prince of Wales has been visiting housing initiatives in Sheffield to promote his homelessness project. The future king spoke to landlords and the local authority to see how his venture could help ease pressure on councils. The outing comes after The Sun published pictures and a video of Prince William with the Princess of Wales at a farm shop in Windsor on Saturday. It follows weeks of social media speculation surrounding the health and whereabouts of Princess Catherine. And for your latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2711 and €1.1705. The price of gold is £1,694.14 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,721 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Sophia. Now, still to come, former Tory MP Nadine Doris opens up about the distressing experience as a nurse which set her on the road to campaign against early abortions. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9pm. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel.
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Earlier on Breakfast. Good morning to you all. An embattled Prime Minister is urging colleagues to stick with him as leadership rumours fail to disappear. The Conservative Party uh, is very united. We should not let disagreements turn into speculation. The public are so rude and so unkind and so demanding as if they own her, as if they bought her. Tell me, Ma, when I get home, <laughs> the boys won't leave the girls alone. They pulled my hair, they stole my comb, but that's all right till I go home. From six, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. It's 3.38. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Nadine Doris has been speaking out about reducing the UK's pills by post-abortion timeline, having previously argued for a reduction in the legal termination of 24 weeks, the limit. The former Conservative Secretary of State spoke of psychological scarring she experienced when witnessing a late termination of a foetus during her time as a trainee nurse. And I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by Nadine Doris, who's an author and, of course, is the former Conservative Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Welcome to the show, Nadine. Always a pleasure. A very moving article you wrote in the mail on this topic. And, of course, society seems to be getting ever closer to making abortion much, much easier. And yet you've reflected back on an experience you witnessed when a trainee nurse. Can you share that with us, please? Yeah, so the point of writing the article is in my column in today's Daily Mail is because very soon the um, criminal justice bill is coming back to Parliament and to that bill, two Labour MPs, Stella Creasy and Diana Johnson, have laid down an amendment asking for the decriminalisation of pills by post, abortion pills, abortifacent pills sent to people's homes up until birth. So at the moment, the limit is 24 weeks. And what they're saying is that... Um, that women who are bought later and either by accident or because they've lied about the point at which they're pregnant shouldn't be prosecuted, they shouldn't be criminalised for doing so. And, and actually, I was, as a health minister, I was completely opposed to the pills by post being put in place. And that's because what the system used to do was women used to go to a clinic, they used to have an ultrasound, we used to be able to tell exactly how many weeks pregnant they were. Then they were given the bill, pills to take home. Now what's happened is the system depends on the woman declaring on what stage of pregnancy she's at. We're expecting her to be truthful and to, to know fully her own body, which is you know fair enough. But it's, it is a system which is open to abuse for desperate and vulnerable women. And what they can find themselves in is a terrible situation where they're actually aborting late-term fetus, 12, 24 weeks onwards, and they could be aborting live fetuses. And many women are going through this process at home and alone. And sorry, just on your introduction, you said I campaigned against early abortion. I've never done that. I'm actually someone who's an advocate for early abortion as easy as possible, as accessible as possible, so that we prevent the situation where we end up having late-term abortions. So, Nadine, um, it's, it's a thorny topic. And, of course, there's this balancing act between my body, my choice, women's rights, dating back decades, and, of course, to the point where the unborn child, at what point do they become a human? And if we're aborting so late via pills, there's also the damage psychologically and physically it can do to the mother because they may not be equipped for what's about to happen. Well, that's very true. And... Now, what, what's happening now is that babies are born, neonates are being born ever earlier because medical science has advanced so much, neonatal care has advanced. We have babies being born at 23, 22, 21 weeks who are surviving. It's unlikely without medical intervention that babies born at that point would survive because their lungs simply aren't developed enough to do so. And what I wrote in my article was when I witnessed a 27 week termination because when I was trained to be a nurse, it was legal up to 28 weeks and a baby breathed and lived for seven minutes. It was a horrible, awful situation. And 
what we're doing by decriminalising or what Stella Creasy and Diana Johnson want to do in amending this bill is put women in a position where they will be at home facing that situation. I was a nurse assisting a late-term abortion. These will be women aborting their own babies who will have a breathing baby in their arms afterwards. And that's not a position I would want to see any woman have to be in, whether they arrive there by accident or not. It's it's not a position, it's mentally scarring and it's also physically very difficult. And so I'm hoping that, and I know many of us are, that Miriam Cates, who is one of the few Conservative MPs who actually does her job and isn't vying to be Prime Minister, has is rallying the support of Conservative MPs to vote down the entire criminal justice bill if these amendments are voted on. And it's a drastic measure because it will vote down many, many measures that are needed in that bill. But I'm afraid if the swan song of a Conservative government is going to be that it legalised abortion up until the point of birth, and, you know, our lack of achievement is, is a, you know, a low bar, but that would be a pretty awful thing for a Conservative government to finish on. I think many people listening in will, will totally agree with that heartfelt message, Nadine. What would you like to see as a more healthy compromise? So I, I just don't want this amendment to go through. And I'd, I'd like to see women who want to abort up until 12 weeks or wherever, you know, not to have to go through the process of two doctors' signatures. It's a farce. It's ridiculous because apart from anything else, you know, quite often doesn't happen. But that, you know, women are adults. They're, they're adults. They, they know what, at that stage, they know what they want to do. And, and, and it should be far more accessible than it is now. Having said that, the Pills by Post has 87% of abortions take place under Pills by Post. Um, it is still the case that if you have to go to a clinic or a doctor, the legal limit of 24 weeks will apply. But I just think making, you know, a, the, at an early stage, the whole system much more streamlined, easier for women to obtain. And then that's, that will reduce the number of abortions overall because women won't be having, you know, late-term abortions, women will... And probably better access to, sorry, those two don't, uh, I'm not co-joined, also better access to, um, to you know, we've got, a, we've, we now have antibiotics available at a pharmacy without having to go and see a GP first. Maybe we should be doing the same with birth controls for women. So there are lots of measures that can be put in place to make it so that we, we can make abortions rarer and, and not as dangerous and that women won't need to go for late-term abortions if we can put much more emphasis on the early stages. OK, Nadine Doris, a heartfelt plea. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon on GB News. Always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Now, if you're an actor or a comedian in Scotland, you better watch out. You might be having your collar felt if the police think you've committed a hate crime by telling the wrong kind of joke, which in itself is an absolute joke. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Largely cloudy for the rest of today, turning damp once again from the southwest, but it will stay mild in the south, although feeling colder further north. Now, we've seen a weather front pass through overnight last night. Next system coming along for overnight tonight with outbreaks of rain by the end of the afternoon, pushing into the southwest of England, Wales, and then across many central and southern parts of England before turning up by midnight into Northern Ireland, southern Scotland and northern England. It does turn drier in the far south and southeast, although rather cloudy, 10 Celsius here by dawn, colder and clearer for the far northwest of Scotland, a touch of frost possible. But in between, a lot of cloud cover, outbreaks of rain. Some of this will be heavy across parts of Wales and northern England. The rain does tend to peter out through the morning. It turns more showery, I think, by the afternoon. But it does linger there across northern England into Wales and parts of the southwest. The far southeast stays dry with some bright spells and highs of 18 Celsius. Much fresher for Scotland and Northern Ireland. After early rain, it does clear up and uh, there will be some sunshine, but temperatures will reach 9 or 10 Celsius. A wetter and windier day to come for Scotland and Northern Ireland on Thursday. That rain pushing into the far northwest of England and Wales by the end of the day, but staying dry in the south and southeast. Friday's a very showery day and it also turns colder later this week.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. 3.48 is your time. At 4 o'clock, I'll bring you our exclusive interview with Donald Trump. And the next hour, I'll speak live to the man who landed that mega scoop, the one and only Mr Nigel Farage. Now to a story that I can confidently say is an absolute joke. Police officers in Scotland are being told they should target actors and comedians under the country's new hate crime laws. Well, GB News' Scotland reporter Tony Maguire is in Glasgow. Tony, welcome to the show. Scotland is about to bring in the most draconian free speech laws on the planet. What on earth is going on? Yes, indeed, and let's not forget that some, Scotland has some of the most out-there comedians. I mean, I only really to need to mention the names of Frankie Boyle and our very own Leo Kers, of course. But, yes, this is indeed um, a revelation today from the Scottish daily newspaper The Herald. They have come across documentation from, from training materials for Police Scotland that is to instruct police to look at performers specifically for an avenue of um, hate speech and public order. Now, this is the hate speech and, uh, sorry, hate crime and public order bill. This has been in the works for quite some time. In fact, we need to go right back to when the now First Minister, Hamza Youssef, he was the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in Scotland. And this bill has been controversial from day one, let me tell you. Not only now um, do many people fear that it is going to be weaponised um, to steer the gender ideology debate one way or the other, but now it seems that comedians and, of course, home of the Fringe Festival here in Edinburgh, well, in Edinburgh up here in Scotland, comedians are going to be very, very cautious now about what is, constitutes a violation of this new act. Now, it comes in, this is one of my, my favourite little details, it comes in on April 1st, of course, a day... April Fool's Day, known for laughter and joking around. Well, it seems that maybe for the first time it's going to be rather some cautious laughter this year. Now, I'm outside the Stand Comedy Club here in Glasgow. This is very much an institution of the comedy scene in Glasgow. If you can name that comedian, there's a very good chance that if they played in Glasgow at some point in their career, they played here. It's and indeed, right it's Scot as I said at the top there, Scotland has some of those comedians like Frankie Boyle, Kevin Bridges, um, and of course our own Leo Kers. Now, um, it's very much a case of let's wait and see who's laughing on the 1st of April. And indeed, Tony Maguire coming in on the 1st of April. You couldn't make it up. The April Fool here will be Humza Yousaf, no doubt. I mean, and also these hate, lo hate laws will include things like misgendering people. And J.K. Rowling, no less, has said that she will specifically and deliberately set out to break these laws and see what happens. Tony Maguire from Glasgow, thank you for joining us on the show. Now, the name's Daubney. 
Martin Daubney, licensed to present a TV show. I've always wanted to say that. And one of the big stories today is that it looks like the new James Bond has been identified, and it's Aaron Taylor Johnson. The 33-year-old British star is reportedly set to replace Daniel Craig as the next actor to play the magnificent spy. Well, I'm delighted to say I'm now joined by former Bond girl Jenny Hanley. She was in on Her Majesty's Secret Service alongside Dinah Rigg, Joanna Lumley and, of course, George Lazenby. Welcome to the show, Jenny. Fantastic. I watched all of the Bond movies in sequential order during lockdown and the one you were in was magnificent. What do you make of the latest um, announcement? I think a lot, of, a lot of us thought James Bond might be black or trans. <laughs> I think it proves that everybody still loves James Bond because they are so interested in it and making such extraordinary claims. Um, I was listening to this morning when, <clears throat> excuse me, when somebody said, oh, it can't be him because he's got long hair. Have you ever heard of a barber's? <laughs> I mean, people can have their hair cut. They can <laughs> shave their beards as well. But, you know, it's been, it's not the 60s anymore. And... For instance, this, I love James Bond, on mm. His Majesty's Secret Service, not written, of course, by Ian Fleming. And this one, Devil May Care, another Bond book, given permission by the Fleming Company, Fleming Publishing. Bond is moving on. Let him. Mm, good stuff. And um, it is gratifying, though, is it not, that the actor is English? I think that's important, don't you? I do, but, you know, he's an actor. There are lots of American actors who can speak very good English. Uh, there are lots of English actors who speak very good French. Uh, French? American. But they are actors. I mean, I love Lee Child books, and mm -hmm. his hero is Jack Reader. Now, Jack Reader in the books is, uh, what is he, six foot five. And who played him in the films? Tom Cruise. <laughs> a foot shorter, but he made it his own. You know, we can't criticise until we see. Super, super. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jenny Hanley, former Bongo, and you really put on a cracking performance in that film. And that was George Lazenby. That was his only Bond appearance, wasn't it? Lazenby, he's only, and he was the youngest Bond at 29. This fella's 33. He's bang on the right age, because in Moonraker, Fleming said Bond was aged 37. So ticks all the boxes for me. Thank you very much for joining us, Jenny Hanley. Superb stuff. Thank you. Now, then, stand by for more of our world-exclusive interview with Donald Trump. He's been talking to Nigel Farage. You will not want to miss what he's had to say about NATO. That, for me, is the most important part of this interview, the future of world peace and what it means with Donald Trump. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News. Here's your weather with Aidan McGibbon. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Largely cloudy for the rest of the day, turning damp once again from the southwest, but it will stay mild in the south, although feeling colder further north. Now, we've seen a weather front pass through overnight last night. Next system coming along for overnight tonight with outbreaks of rain by the end of the afternoon, pushing into the southwest of England, Wales, and then across many central and southern parts of England before turning up by midnight into Northern Ireland, southern Scotland, and northern England. It does turn drier in the far south and southeast, although rather cloudy, 10 Celsius here by dawn, colder and clearer for the far northwest of Scotland, a touch of frost possible. But in between, a lot of cloud cover, outbreaks of rain. Some of this will be heavy across parts of Wales and northern England. The rain does tend to peter out through the morning. It turns more showery, I think, by the afternoon. But it does linger there across northern England into Wales and parts of the southwest. The far southeast stays dry with some bright spells and highs of 18 Celsius. Much fresher for Scotland and Northern Ireland. After early rain, it does clear up and uh, there will be some sunshine, but temperatures will reach 9 or 10 Celsius. Celsius, a wetter and windier day to come for Scotland and Northern Ireland on Thursday. That rain pushing into the far northwest of England and Wales by the end of the day, but staying dry in the south and southeast. Friday's a very showery day and it also turns colder later this week.
That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. A very good afternoon to you. It's 4 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up, we've got our world-exclusive interview with Donald Trump, and you will not want to miss what he has to say about NATO. I'll be joined live by the man Nigel himself in around half an hour's time. Stand by for that. And it's another tough day for Rishi Sunak. When aren't they tough days for the Prime Minister at the moment? Some of his fellow Tory MPs are looking to replace him. Surely we can't have yet another change of Prime Minister. And that's all coming up in your next hour. Well, we've got this as well, because a top politician has name-checked Margaret Thatcher today. Nothing unusual with that. But what is unusual is it's a shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves who's done it. And that definitely is all coming in your next hour. So fasten seatbelts, brace yourself. Nigel is about to speak to Donald Trump. The full interview, of course, is tonight, 7 p.m. on Farage's show. But we're getting a sneak preview, and I'm delighted to say I think it's the most exciting bit of the whole thing. Donald Trump talking about NATO. Now, the last time Trump talked about NATO, the White House called his comments unhinged. What they had to say 
about this. You'll get a chance to see that very, very shortly. Email me your opinions, gbviews at gbnews.com. What do you make about Trump? Do you think we need a Trump? Do you think Nigel might go and work for Donald Trump? Might that break the hearts of British Conservatives who want Nigel to return to frontline politics in the UK? Let me know your thoughts. That's all coming up. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you, and good afternoon to you. Well, the top story, as you've been hearing, the former US President Donald Trump has been firing a warning shot at NATO, saying it's time to pay up. In a GB News World exclusive, he spoke to Nigel Farage and sent a clear message to member countries. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this back in 2017 and 18 when you were president. You visited Brussels. You said it again recently. You made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Yeah. That's now being that's, used. Yeah, well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stopped paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks yeah. ago. I don't know if you know, but a lot yeah. of money's come in since those comments were made. Well, you can see the full interview with the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, on Farage tonight from 7 o'clock right here, GB News. Now, in other news today, the first person to be convicted of cyber flashing in England and Wales has been jailed for 66 weeks. 39-year-old Nicholas Hawke sent unsolicited explicit photographs to a teenager and a woman. The Justice Secretary described the offence as a distressing crime, which can't be normalised, and said the sentence sends a clear message that the behaviour has severe consequences. Britain faces a 1979 moment, the Shadow Chancellor will say in a speech tonight, as Labour seeks to bring about a new chapter in Britain's economic history. Addressing finance leaders this evening, Rachel Reeves will liken the challenge awaiting the next government to that faced by Margaret Thatcher. She's made it clear she plans to reform the Treasury if Labour wins the general election. Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Darren Jones, outlined her plan. We are on the cusp of an opportunity in this country, an opportunity for a decade of national renewal where we can get growth back into our economy, make people better off um, and start to turn the page on 14 years of failure from the Conservatives. If Labour is to win the election later this year, uh, it will be the worst fiscal inheritance that any party's had since the Second World War. And that's why we talk about a decade of national renewal. There will be some things we can do immediately and public services are obviously one of our priorities. Now, the First Minister of Wales faced questions in the Senate for the final time today before he formally tenders his resignation to the King. Mark Drakeford is stepping down after five years in his job. He'll be succeeded by Vaughan Gething, who's set to become the first black leader of a European country. The leader of the Welsh Conservatives, Andrew R.T. Davis, asked him if he had any words of wisdom for his successor. What advice or of the experience that you've had as First Minister due it in preparation for First Minister's questions and taking part in First Minister's questions. He will take up, I'm afraid, hours and hours uh, of his time uh, because it's uh, unavoidable that if you come here and you can be asked a question, not simply any question on the brief you happen to hold, but any question on any part of the Welsh Government that every single uh, weekend, it's a bit like preparing for finals. Now, Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A new report has found that 47% of local road miles were rated as being in good condition, with 36% adequate and 17% poor. Well, the Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils were expected to fix two million potholes in the current financial year. That's up 43% on the previous year and the highest annual total since 2015 to 16. 
Now, the Prince of Wales is visiting housing initiatives in Sheffield today to promote his homelessness project. The outing comes after he was pictured with his wife, the Princess of Wales, while out shopping near their home in Windsor for the first time since her operation in January. The Sun has published pictures and a video of Princess Catherine with William, who were at a farm shop on Saturday. It follows weeks of social media speculation surrounding her health and her whereabouts. For the very latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Back now to Martin. Thank you, Polly. Now we start with our massive world exclusive interview with the former US president. Donald Trump. Nigel Farage sat down with him last night for a chat in Florida. The interview lasted for about half an hour and they covered US politics, Harry and Meghan, that Princess Kate's picture, world politics and, of course, NATO. Check this out. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this back in 2017 and 18 when you were president, you visited Brussels, you said it again recently, you made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Yeah. That's now being that's, used. Well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. Yeah. I don't know if you know, but a lot yeah. of money's come in since those comments were made. Yeah. So NATO was not paying. And I said, well, the United States, they take advantage of the U.S. on trade like crazy, you know, as bad as almost anybody. And then on top of it, the NATO were largely similar countries, the same countries. NATO, they weren't paying their bills. And I went to the first meeting and I saw that. I didn't want to do it my first meeting. I just got there. But I went to the first meeting early in my administration and I saw what was going on. And I said, you're going to have to pay your bills, everybody. And the second meeting, I hit them hard. And uh, the question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, mm -hmm. including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope, I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. And hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? So there we are. The gloves are off. Shots are fired. And believe me, you do not want to miss this epic encounter. Nigel Farage's exclusive interview with Donald Trump will be live on GB News exclusively from 7 p.m. this evening. And a reminder that I'll be joined live by that man, Nigel Farage himself, at half past four, direct from Florida. Very fine, he was looking earlier too, in sunglasses by Trump's pool. And there's plenty more coverage of his Donald Trump interview on our website, gbnews.com. And you've helped to make it the fastest growing national news website in the country. Well, for reaction to that, I'm now joined in the studio by our political editor, Christopher Hope, and the Tory peer and the brilliant pollster, <laughs> Lord Robert Hayward. Nobody gets called brilliant. Well done. <laughs> so, so let's start with a reaction to that interview, Chris. Mm. Um, you know, no holds barred. It's what you'd expect from Donald yeah. Trump. Will he get back into the White House? That's one question. If he does, will he really get on the front foot and take this battle to NATO last time round, he said it's time to pay up more. Yeah. Now he's saying you have to pay or you're in big trouble. If this guy gets back in, it's going to be anarchy. Well, or, or is it? Because essentially he's trying to wake up Europe to the pressure, the concern about Russia and the existential threat to some countries on continental Europe. Um, I think it's working. I think a year ago, 11 out of 31 countries paid 2% of their economic output on defence. It's now 18 this year, and that's a, a trend going... It's gone up by half in a year. They can see what's coming down the track. Mm -hmm. It looks like Trump could win this election, according to polls, certainly give Joe Biden a run for his money, and already they're spending more of their own dosh 
on their defence, which is the point which, in a very humble brag way, the president <laughs> made there to Nigel Farage by saying, on oh, my first visit, I didn't want to overstep it. And then they did, did overstep it, which is very Trump, which is probably why everyone quite likes him in America, because he, he gets, actually gets things done. Yeah. Americans are saying, put America first, why are we spending money on Europe's defence when we can't even secure our southern border? And he's showing how it works. And Lord Robert Hayward, you were chortling away there. And during the interview itself, you were like going, he's so modest. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris has a point. Here's a guy, you know, he, he's on the cobbles. He talks direct. It seems NATO are listening. America has its own financial problems. There's no question about it. It's not just funding of the border, but all sorts of other excessive government expenditure. But Russia invaded the Ukraine. And I have a sneaking <laughs> feeling that the delinquents, to use the phrase that Donald Trump used, i.e. the Germans and one or two others, who had cut defence expenditure virtually to zero, mm. uh, have responded more to the Russian advance in the Ukraine mm. and the threats to the likes of Finland and the Balkan, <laughs> Baltic states than they have to Donald Trump's uh, modest, you know, <laughs> just uh, comments in relation to uh, their expenditure. But, but nevertheless, he does seem to be setting the sort of mm. drumbeat, if you like, to what we can expect if he comes back for round two. And, you know, he said straight away in the show earlier, yeah, drill, baby, drill, you know, get fossil fuels pumping again, um, lay down the gauntlet to NATO. He's shooting from the hip, but he's not even in the place yet. I think that's a fair term, shooting from the hip mm. is absolute classic Donald Trump, mm. uh, no modesty associated with it, and he makes clear where he wants to go, and that's what appeals mm. to many Americans. It turns off a lot of Europeans because they're not of the same nature. Mm. Um, but if I were a betting man, which I am not, uh, but if the election were tomorrow, Donald Trump would win. Yeah. Well, I've asked, in, asked Downing Street in the afternoon meeting with the, his, with the PM, Richard Sunak's spokesman, will he be watching the interview tonight? They're going to get back to me. But it, it seems it might be <laughs> wise yes. to watch. Well, it might be wise to watch it because I think it's going to be quite instructive for our own election. If this the elect, well, the US election is the 5th of November. Now, if Richard really Sunak goes before or after that date, late October yep. or the mm. 7th or, or the 14th, I'm not sure what you think, Robert, on what's your best de best bet for the for the election this year. But it will, I think, the impact on a special relationship from a Keir Starmer-led government yeah. or a Richard Sunak one will have a bearing on the, on the election. No, there's no question that there will be an undercurrent of watching what's going on in the United States. I've said for a year and a half the election would be in October stroke November, not sure precisely what date, uh, but uh, in terms of international security uh, issues, uh, it's important that we do watch what's going on and this country, whether you're talking to Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak, you will have to ask the questions, how will you work with Donald Trump? Because that, as I just said just now, is likely to be the position in terms of the American presidency. Mm. And let's talk, um, you're a brilliant pollster, a magnificent pollster. I'll, I'll cope with the modest uh, okay. description, thank you. <laughs> let's talk about the poll that came out today. More grim reading for Rishi Sunak. Labour now ahead by 26 points, Labour on 47, Tories 21, and Reform nibbling up on the inside on 14%. It's a grim read for Rishi Sunak. Yeah, the polls for the Tories have broadly flatlined. They've gone up and down in one direction or another. The poll you're referring to went uh, was almost as low a month ago. It went back up and then it's come back down. And what is striking is that there is this uh, Tories flatlining and then there's an oscillation in terms of the other political parties, including what I would term the disruptors, i.e. reform, the Greens, people who are not going to vote, uh, people who are supporting all sorts of minority parties. Mm. And uh, at the moment, the indications are that the Conservatives are flatlining. Would it make any difference if the PM was replaced? Now, the, you, know, you and I work in Parliament like I do. You're hearing and people who don't normally talk about this stuff are now saying it, should he be replaced, and should be replaced by Penny Mordaunt. Would that help them in the polls? Absolutely none. The public at large in this country, and we were talking international affairs just now, um, the rest of the world, the democratic world, would be stupefied if we've... The problem for the Conservative Party has been trying to recover from the chaos of 20 2020 to 2022. Uh, they haven't, in the public's mind's eye, 
put that behind them. Uh, and to change leader at this point, the overwhelming majority of Conservative MPs, I take your point, there are some, but the overwhelming majority of Conservative MPs take the view that it would be insanity to change leader at this point. There is one particular factor. If the Conservative Party itself were markedly more popular than the party leader, then there might be a case for that. That is not the position at the moment. Both the Conservative <coughs> Party and the leader are as unpopular. So there is zero case for changing a leader this close to a general election. Surely there is, if, to use a metaphor, the ship is heading for the iceberg. Why stick with the captain that's setting a course for disaster? For the reason I've just identified, because the people, the population at large, are still identifying the era of 2020 to 2022 as much of the problem. And they're not saying, if you change the leader, the position will change. They are saying, we don't like the Conservatives. Or, alternatively, they are saying, we're not sure. And this is where you've got this huge block of former Conservatives who haven't decided where they're going. They certainly won't come back to the Conservative Party on the basis of changing well, leader. Under anyone, even Penny Mordon, to Labour fear? Uh, <laughs> The people who want to change have gone through a series of different individuals. Yes. They're falling on somebody after another after another after their attempted uh, disruption uh, has failed. At the moment, it's Penny that they're talking about. Uh, and Penny's made absolutely clear, as she said this morning as she came out of Cabinet, I'm getting on with my job. Um, I, I've got a lot of time for Penny. Suddenly, they decided that somebody from the centre must be the alternative. It, it just doesn't wash. They're moving from one person to the next in a, an incoherent effort of desperation, in simple terms. That's a bit like a saying, I've got full confidence in the man and then the next morning, the, the director sacks the gaffer. Anyway, what about bringing back Farage into this? A lot of people saying that if he comes back into frontline politics in Britain and 14% for reform now could easily become significantly more, and the Tories continue, there could be that crossover. Are you hoping that Donald Trump gives that fellow a job? <laughs> Nigel Farage I get on with very well. Uh, he's a very good interviewer. Um, and he is part of the disruption that one's seeing in British politics. The public at large not committed to any political party. Um, but I don't see Nigel Farage as part of the Tory party, and I don't, to be honest, think he does either. <laughs> Well, there he is, laughing away. He sees himself as part of the Tory party there, because, look, he got more selfies than any of the Conservatives there, dancing away, literally, with Pretty Patel. And I think you, you may see that a few Tories out there, Lord Hayward would like Would, this you, would, would you stay in a party with Nigel Farage, Robert Hayward? Uh, I, I... I'd have to see what he was advocating. I, as far as I'm concerned, you look at any individual, but mm. is Nigel Farage going to go back to rejoin the Conservative Party in the way that he was previously, or is he now adopting Reform Party uh, policies, um, which are actually, in a fair number of ways, pretty left-wing <laughs> in terms of their commitment to expenditure on a whole series of things? No, I'm a sound Conservative economist in terms of of the views and the support of private entrepreneurship. Mm. And at the moment, the Reform Party is nowhere near that. So if Nigel pursues those policies, I couldn't support him. OK, excellent stuff. The brilliant pollster, Lord Robert Hayward, and Chris Hope is brilliant and everything. Great stuff. <laughs> Let's move on. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, there's still plenty of time to grab our spring prizes in the Great British Giveaway, and that's a shopping spree, a gadgets bundle, and an incredible 12,344, 45 quid, one, two, three, four, five, tax-free cash. But you've got to be in it to win it, and here's how you could trouser it. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, 
text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Fill your boots. Now, Rachel Reeves could be Labour's version of Margaret Thatcher. Now, I'm sure that's um, something you weren't <laughs> expecting to hear, particularly on GB News. But Liam Halligan will have the full story. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Free Speech Nation. Sunday nights from 7 p.m. I've got an idea. I think that all 30-year-olds should be given £10,000 from the banks of baby boomers. We've got a situation in this country now where millennials are the first generation in modern times expecting to be poorer than their parents. We, as 30-year-olds like me, are half as likely to own a house as people my age 30 years ago. In fact, the cost of a home in Britain compared to average incomes has as big a gap today as it did, wait for it, in the 1860s. It is a Dickensian situation. Now, I'm sorry about the housing crisis for your generation. You're not, though, are you? No, because you're I profiting am. from it. I'm profiting from it. Don't be ridiculous. You are. The house prices now, right. compared to that period. If this is the case, have, Benjamin. Have incomes gone up that fast? To, to penalise and punish the elderly when they have worked yeah. all their lives to put into the system and say it's your fault, whingy whiny, we're going to yeah, be envious of it. No, Linda, go, we're no, being punished. No, well, by the we're, politics, so be we're the change being punished you want to see in the world. Taxes, taxes, I am actually, and I'm about to tell you about the change I want to see in the world. Are you good? As long as you're whining about it. I'm going to stop whining about it, but the re we are being taken advantage of at the moment to profit, to help the old. Mo most of taxpayers' money is spent in two departments, the NHS, so the health department, and the Department for Work and Pensions. Those departments disproportionately serve the older population. Now, I've got no issue with that, but let's not pretend, let's not pretend that it is not young working people that is paying for the public services for old people. So actually, we are having it hard, and I just look at the future, and we see a future of perpetually higher taxes to pay for this increasing ageing population, a shrinking labour force, and you're here saying so we've got nothing to worry vote. about. The young stop voting for mass immigration. Immigration parties, the young, I haven't. stop voting for Immigr parties Sorry, just to, that just to don't point out, build houses. Immigrants actually pay taxes, pensioners don't. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.25. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, later this hour, I'll talk about the new England football shirts and ask, what on earth have they done with the St George's Cross? In my opinion, sacrilege. Now, moving on, shall we talk about the economy? Because Britain faces a 1979 moment. That's what shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is expected to say in her annual May lecture tonight. The Labour Chancellor is expected to announce working with businesses to create a decade of national renewal. Well, joining me now to discuss this is GB News' economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, welcome to the show. Always an absolute pleasure. So, say a lot of things about Rachel Rees, but not a lot of people would compare her to Margaret Thatcher. Tell us what's going on in this announcement today. 
There's a little bit of media mischief going on here, Martin. Look, the Shadow Chancellor isn't comparing herself to Margaret Thatcher. What she is doing is she's talking about the late 1970s, a period that you and I know well, because basically Britain, uh, the economy was on its knees. It was the winter of discontent. You had rubbish in the streets. You had a huge amount of industrial strike action. And what Rachel Reeves is going to do tonight in her annual Mays lecture, this is a, a lecture given in the City of London, uh, the Mansion House, lots of finery and so on, usually by a big figure from business economics or a City of London titan every year. What she's going to be doing this evening is trying to convey that Labour will be safe with the economy. The economy is safe in Labour's hands. And she's talking about the late 1970s because the late 1970s were, were a period that sparked change. And in, of course, the 80s, there were reforms and the economy eventually turned the corner. A lot of division, a lot of heartache. So that's basically what she's trying to do. It's like a massive prawn cocktail offensive. And that was what happened in the mid-90s when Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and other new Labour denizens in opposition went round the city, went round businesses and said, look, we know that Labour's wrecked the economy in the past, but the economy is safe in our hands. So she's not going to be talking specifics tonight. I've got a little on the money graphic because it wouldn't be on the money without a graphic, would it, Martin? I know you feel shortchanged <laughs> and we don't want to shortchange you. So let's have a look at what Rachel Reeves will actually say. She's going to be talking about growth. That's growth of the economy is achieved through stability. Uh, it's worth saying that Labour have backed all the Tories' budget measures that were in J Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's budget earlier this month, including those tax cuts, the reduction of the headline rate of national insurance for employers, for employees, apologies, from 10 to 8%. Labour's backing those. Somewhat controversially, some may think, the Shadow Chancellor wants more power for the Office for Budget Responsibility. Now, the Office for Budget Responsibility is a bunch of economists in Whitehall who make forecasts which seem to have taken on the status of holy writ. Some people, including me, think that those forecasts really box in uh, the ministers and mean that they can't cut taxes as and when they want to. I think uh, a lot of people will think that's a bit controversial. She wants to make the OBR even more powerful. And also, the Shadow Chancellor says, rather than sacking the Permanent Secretary of the Treasury, which is what Liz Truss did when she came into office. Rachel Reeves says she's going to strengthen the growth unit at HM Treasury. What's the growth unit? It's a bunch of economists in the Treasury who focus on proposals to promote economic growth, growing the pie so each of us can have a bigger slice, rather than focusing, as some of us suspect of the Treasury sometimes, rather than focusing on ways to extract more tax from households and firms. So, look... Very few specifics, I think, in tonight's May's lecture from Rachel Reeves. Labour don't want to give us specifics because if they do, if they come up with um, exact policies, the likes of you and me will scrutinise them and raise difficult points. The government might even nick them, as the government did Labour's policy to strengthen the tax regime around wealthy so-called non-domiciled foreigners, the non-dom taxes living in the UK. Certainly the government pinched that policy from Labour. So there'll be few specifics, lots of mood music, basically a rerun of the mid-90s prawn cocktail offensive. So we can expect some very big crustaceans in the City of London this evening as Rachel Reeves, Shadow Chancellor, reaches out, as it were... No, she's not a member of the Four Tops, but she'll be reaching out anyway to people in the City of London, business audience across the country saying the economy will be safe in Labour's hands. You can trust us with the country and we're going to win the general election. That's what she's going to say. Liam Halligan, superb stuff, prawn cocktails and the four tops. That sounds like a party I'd like to go to. At any rate, Liam Halligan, always a pleasure. Thank you very much. I guess the big question is, how do they fund all this with £2.6 trillion in debt? That's for another time. Liam Halligan, thanks for joining us on the show. Now, don't forget, in just a few minutes' time, Nigel Farage has been speaking to Donald Trump in Florida, and we will be joined by our very own Nigel for his take very soon. Soon, I'll be speaking to Nigel Farage directly after this, live and direct from Florida. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst.
the top stories this hour. Former US President Donald Trump has fired a warning shot at NATO, saying it's time to pay up. In a GB News exclusive, he spoke to Nigel Farage and he sent a clear message to NATO member countries. Why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks yeah. ago. And you can see that full interview on Farage tonight from 7 o'clock right here, GP News. Now, the first person in England and Wales to be convicted of cyber flashing has been jailed. Nicholas Hawke sentenced to 66 weeks for sending unsolicited, explicit photographs to a teenager and a woman. The 39-year-old from Basildon in Essex was already a convicted sex offender when he sent the images. And the Prince of Wales has been visiting housing initiatives in Sheffield to promote his homelessness project. The future king spoke to landlords and the local authority to see how his venture could help ease pressure on councils. And the outing comes after the Sun newspaper published pictures and a video of Prince William with his wife, the Princess of Wales, at a farm shop near their home in Windsor on Saturday. It follows weeks of social media speculation surrounding the health and whereabouts of Princess Catherine. Those are your latest stories. For the top stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you very much, Polly. Now, don't go anywhere. Don't even put the kettle on, because in just a few minutes, I'll be joined live by Nigel Farage after his world-exclusive interview with Donald Trump. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue? Far-right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far-right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her, uh, touching her zip, because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle, because she's... she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And and also, <laughs> also, this isn't a far-right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly... Yeah. I mean, well, this is just a swastika. She's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far-right. But also, I mean... even if she were right-wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an... One of the most important issues of our day. What well, are Labour playing out here? They're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if you no, say won't. that, will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10am every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.36. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News. Well, coming up, I'll be telling you why some three Lions fans aren't happy with the new England football kit, and I'm one of them. But now it's finally time for the moment we've all been waiting for. I'm joined now by the main man himself, Nigel Farage. Nigel, welcome to the show. Just seeing a sneak preview um, of you talking with Donald Trump about NATO, really getting the juices flowing about how... Trump was on form and holding no punches, as you'd expect. The NATO issue, Nigel, is massive. Tell us about it. The NATO issue is huge. You see, he made this comment at a rally a few weeks ago where he said, look, you know, if people don't pay the 2%, if people don't pay the membership fee, then Russia can just do what the hell it likes. That has been taken by all those in favour of the European Union, all the globalists, and they've all said, you know, from people like Malcolm Rifkin, the, the former Foreign Secretary, right the way through, and people are saying, ah, right, so, if Trump wins, America put out of NATO, so we must have a full European Defence Union, some even talking about the EU having its own nuclear weapons. Uh, and I was so worried about this, if there was one thing I wanted to get from this interview, it was a clear, definitive answer from Trump on where he really stood on NATO, and in particular, American leadership of it. And he's absolutely clear that when he makes those comments, they are a negotiating tactic. That's what he does. Read the book, The Art of the Deal. It's all there. But I asked him, you know, what would happen if Poland was invaded? And he said, look, you see, provided everyone's paid their money, we are with you 100%. And I hope that puts to bed some of these ridiculous stories that have been put out. Uh, and I hope we have a much deeper think ourselves about the extent to which we are getting involved with European defence treaties. And, Nigel, this kind of brinksmanship is what we saw from Donald Trump in the first time around. Do you get a flavour, having been up close and personal, looking him in the eyes, spending time with him off camera? We're going to get the same, but with bells on, if he gets back in for a second time. Oh, I think Trump 2.0 will be quite something. Uh, he will be uninhibited. He will also, then, here's the real difference, he'll have a team of experienced professionals around him, which he did not have in January 2017 when he first walked into the White House. The whole feel of the Trump operation, the whole buzz at Mar-a-Lago, it's so much more professional than anything he's ever done before. And you know what? At the moment, he's winning and winning big. And particularly, you look at the key six or seven states that will decide who wins the presidency. Presidency, he's now comfortably ahead in nearly all of them. So, yeah, you know, despite massive fines being imposed from New York and all these different court cases that he's facing, despite everything, um, his resilience and optimism, it, it really is quite extraordinary. And Nigel, Barack Obama was in Downing Street yesterday, of course. The last time he was here, he was telling Brexiteers would be at the back of the queue. Um, did Donald Trump give any indication of what he might be like if he was working with Sir Keir Starmer, if Sir Keir Starmer were to get in as Prime Minister in Britain? Yeah. Well, I did ask that question. I, d I did say that it's, you know, odds on, big time that uh, Keir Starmer will be in number 10. Um, and Trump made it clear there's been no communication of any kind between him and the Starmer camp. And my worry, really, is not so much Starmer, but it's, it, frankly, David Lammy. Um, if David Lammy carries on from being the shadow foreign secretary, the full job. You know, he has said that Trump is a woman-hating neo-Nazi. Now, quite difficult, isn't it, to do business <laughs> when, when you've said something as highly abusive as that. And, and this is why I keep making this point, and everyone thinks it's me offering myself for the job, but we're going to need an ambassador in Washington with a Labour government that can have a proper conversation and act as an intermediary between the two governments. And we need somebody who's not your standard Oxbridge foreign office type, someone that actually knows Trump and can do the right thing.
And Nigel, that brings me neatly onto my next question. We've had a lot of emails in here asking about if you're going to work for Donald Trump. Christine here says this. Nigel in Florida, it makes me very nervous. We need Nigel back in Britain to save our country. Well, look, it keeps the newspapers amused, doesn't it? You know, some of them write that I could be Britain's ambassador to uh, uh, Washington. Others write I could be Trump's ambassador to London. Others say I'm coming back into frontline politics. Um, uh, Martin, I'm just a humble broadcaster, merely going about my life. And if people want to have fun speculating, well, good for them. Yeah, you're being very humble there. Looking very dapper as well, I've got to say, in the sunglasses poolside there. I want to ask you one final question. People talk about yeah. the mental competency of Joe Biden a lot, and the Biden camera tried to spin this back onto Donald Trump. Up close, up personal, is this a guy you think is ready to rule America? Do you know, in some ways, he looks fitter and healthier than he did way back in 2016. You know, for a guy approaching 78, he looks really well. Uh, he's shed weight from his time as president. Um, he, is, he is absolutely fit. And mentally, well, he might make the odd mistake. Who doesn't? We do, Martin, with our job. We all make the odd mistake. Joe Biden makes several every day. That's a very, very big difference. Trump is as fit as I've ever seen him. Superb stuff. So, Nigel Farage, thank you so much for taking time out to join us. I know you're incredibly busy, and, of course, that exclusive is on your show tonight. 7 p.m., you will not want to miss it. Thank you, Nigel Farage. There it is. You will not want to miss this. Nigel Farage's exclusive interview with Donald Trump will be live on GB News from 7 o'clock this evening. You will only get it here. What's more, he's actually said, Trump, he won't speak to other British media. And let's see how that makes him react in the mainstream media. They'll be clutching their pearls over that one, no doubt. Now, England's new kits for the upcoming Euro 2024 tournament. Well, it's already divided three Lions fans. It looks great from the front, but wait till you see the backside. Not of um, Aidan McGiven, not of Aidan McGee even. But <laughs> of that kit, I'll be joined by a sports <laughs> journalist to get his take on it next. Aidan McGee's with me. I'm Martin Daubney <laughs> on GB News, Britain's news channel. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Largely cloudy for the rest of the day, turning damp once again from the southwest, but it will stay mild in the south, although feeling colder further north. Now, we've seen a weather front pass through overnight last night. Next system coming along for overnight tonight with outbreaks of rain by the end of the afternoon, pushing into the southwest of England, Wales, and then across many central and southern parts of England before turning up by midnight into Northern Ireland, southern Scotland and northern England. It does turn drier in the far south and southeast, although rather cloudy. 10 Celsius here by dawn, colder and clearer for the far northwest of Scotland, a touch of frost possible. But in between, a lot of cloud cover, outbreaks of rain. Some of this will be heavy across parts of Wales and northern England. The rain does tend to peter out through the morning. It turns more showery, I think, by the afternoon. But it does linger there across northern England into Wales and parts of the southwest. The far southeast stays dry with some bright spells and highs of 18 Celsius. Much fresher for Scotland and Northern Ireland. After early rain, it does clear up and uh, there will be some sunshine, but temperatures will reach 9 or 10 Celsius. A wetter and windier day to come for Scotland and Northern Ireland on Thursday. That rain pushing into the far northwest of England and Wales by the end of the day, but staying dry in the south and southeast. Friday's a very showery day and it also turns colder later this week. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.46. I'm Moss in Daubney and this is GB News. Now, at 5 o'clock, I'll bring you our world-exclusive interview with Donald Trump. And, of course, he's been talking to Nigel Farage and he's got a warning for NATO. Shots fired. Now, England have unveiled their football kits for the upcoming Euro 2024 tournament and they have already divided fans of the Three Lions. Whilst many people approve of the retro style of England's home kit, the so-called Dark Raisin away strip has raised more than a few eyebrows, with many fans questioning the colour scheme and the decision, the controversial decision, this is the one that stuck in my craw, viewers, to change the colours of St George's flag on the back of the collar. And there's also outrage at the sheer cost of the new shirts for the average England fan, with even the basic shirt set to set you back 85 quid for adults. And it's even more for the full replica shirt, the kit that's worn on the pitch itself. Well, let's discuss this further now with sports broadcaster and journalist Aidan Miggy, Aidan, welcome to the studio. Always a pleasure. Now, a new kit is always a moment that fans obsess over. Um, and from the front, it looks like a corker. It's retro, it ticks a lot of boxes. You think it's 86, I think more Italian 90, but either yeah. way, it's a good doff to that, to that kind of traditional look. No one's really done it since. I'm a bit concerned about this obsession about retro. Mm. There comes a point, we all love retro shirts, of course we do. Each club has got, has got a kit that really sticks in their mind. Forest won this season, your team, mm. they've gone back to the 1970s, the late 70s look when they won the European Cup back-to-back, -back, of course, which you've mentioned once or twice in my company. However, <laughs> I just think some, those were original designs. Some, at some point, 40 years on, you've got to come up with some originality yourself. This is another retro design. It's well done, but I sometimes think that we are... What, what, what's, what's next in the cycle in 20 years' time? You know, do we go back to a retro of the retro? Mm. I mean, it just it seems a bit strange to me. But in terms of the George Cross being on the back, the wrong colour... You know what? Sometimes these, uh, these, are, these are gimmicks. These are to drive coverage. They are to get attention, particularly now in the social media era, to make people look at it. Because I'll tell you why... England changing their kit, or indeed any club changing their kit, is not the big deal that it used to be. Newcastle United, back in the 80s, in, because of the fact that unemployment was high in the area, they used to change their kit every three years. So yeah. if you bought it in, in 1984, you could, you could keep it until 1987. Most clubs around the country change theirs every two years. Nowadays, you're changing it every single year. I think the last club to retain their kit for more than one season was Brentford, and that was about two years ago. So it doesn't happen often. It's, not, it's, it's, not the, it's, a, bit like, it's a bit like car registrations. You know, yeah. used to change them every year. It was a big thing. You wanted the latest reg. Then they started doing it twice a year. There was less of an impact. So you need something eye-catching, so a talking point, and I think this flag on the back of the shirt certainly falls into that category. Yeah, we're going to try and get that image up in a moment. But you can see on screen now, all those who are listening in on GB News Radio, the away shirt. It's purple. Now, the England away kit should be red. It's always been red, or at least the second kit. Now, this... Either to me looks like a quality street, or worse, <laughs> the French. Well, we, like those we like those quality streets, though, don't we? Yeah, They're we had to walk around look like a giant chocolate. No, no, certainly not. Certainly the, not. The England shirt, the away shirt, the classic, beautiful 1966 World Cup winning. It's red. It should always be red. Why are they messing with the winning formula? You know what? They might actually bring out a red one nearer the tournament. It's happened before. Where it, it all depends how it sells, Martin. That's the, that's the key thing here. And that brings us on to the price: eighty-four pounds for the basic shirt that you're buying at a high street sports shop. And then after that, for the one that's actually made by the same material uh, that the players wear, it might have a few badges on it. It might have a few. You know, it might it might be kind of a bit more breathable. Then 
that one will set you back about £125. The big misnomer about football kits, though, is that they're all sold to kids. They're actually not. The biggest degree or the, big, the biggest section of people or demographic who buy football shirts are people who are over the age of 40, I would suggest. And so that's why the Italian 90 stroke Mexico 86 design is going to prove popular. Ticking the box with the old boys, a bit like myself, but I, wouldn't, <laughs> I would not buy this shirt. We're still going to try and get that image because they've changed the St George's flag on the back of the collar. The down stripe is still red, but the cross stripe is a weird purple and blue hybrid. It's not the St George's cross. Why on earth would they change that? To my knowledge, no football club internationally has ever changed their flag on a football shirt. To what are they playing colour. at? Well, I think going back to... We mentioned it off-air, didn't we? I think London 2012, the, the Union flag was changed colour then. They just experimented around it. Nobody really had a problem with it then. I'm not sure, Nig uh, I'm not sure Martin, that... that just on the back of the shirt, it's going to make that much difference. You can't see it on the front. You see more of the front of the shirt of the player than you do on the back, certainly when you're wearing it. And you, when you look in the mirror, it's the front that you see, isn't it? OK, but still, they shouldn't be meddling with the flag. Can we quickly talk about something very painful to me? Nottingham Forest being deducted four points. Steve, my producer, he's Everton. He had even worse, ten points. Well, my QPR team got done for, four, for FFP back in, I think it was 2018, £40 million. Pounds. So it seems to be the smaller clubs that are suffering. So, I mean, I'm not saying that Forest and Everton are small clubs, but they're small in context of the of the top six. So, look, Nottingham Forest knew the rules. They gambled to get up. I think long-term, being in the Premier League over a couple of seasons and even three or four if they manage to stay up this season, I don't think they'll be looking back at this in a few years' time and seeing that the points would have made a much difference. If they stay up this season, the problem just goes away. However... I would ask why they had, had no sponsor for a season. Yeah. That just seems a really foolhardy thing to do. I can't think of another club in recent times who've not had a sponsor even just for a few months. Not, not, not very often in the Premier League era anyway. Brennan Johnson, they're selling him for £47 million. They should, could have got way more than that from, from Tottenham. So there's, there's things they could have done. OK, so we do now have this offending picture of the back of the collar of the New England shirt. Can we get that on screen now? See, if you go in close there, look, that is not... The St George's flag. It's a ridiculous hybrid. It looks more like a kind of LGBTQ combination of the St George's flag. It's the same on the back of the collar. I don't think that has any place on an English. Why change the colour of the national flag? You know what it flag? reminds me of? It reminds me of the Talbot logo from 1983. Do you remember those really terrible cars that used yeah. to be uh, made over here? Well, saying that deserves <laughs> to be scrapped too. Now you might <laughs> you might think you might think I'm overreacting, but flags should be sacrosanct. They matter to fans, and I think they've scored their own goal with this. Eh? Well, okay. What do you think about the front of the badge? I mean, you know, well, that's not a traditional look in terms of the three lines are there, but it used to be inside a shield, didn't it? Do you remember? Yeah. The, and so there, so there are there is going marketeers are going to experiment with designs and what's more what's of more concern to me is that we keep recycling old designs there's nothing new coming through that would be more of concern to me than individual uh, the minor details like like the flag that you're suggesting it's a shame shame um, <laughs> it looks good from the front and not from the back and it's not for the first time i've said that hey aiden <laughs> let's leave it there let's have a few emails um, to end this hour before i lose my job now we've been talking a lot about <laughs> rwanda um, and Gordon says this. I'm a British citizen. Can I please accept a free place to go to Rwanda with a job, a house, free money, plenty of sunshine and a much better way of life than I've got here? You know, Gordon, I think you make a great point. They're getting three grand in cash, a free house for five years, guaranteed work, and you get away from this country. I think a lot of people might think that has a benefit. Donald says this, we need to get rid of the House of Lords, this course is on Rwanda as well. Why do we let unelected people override our elected government? It's absolutely ludicrous. And Donald, totally agree, that's with huge echoes of Brexit. And quickly, Tony says this, are we heading for a reform Tory coalition? I get behind that because reform would not be as weak as the Lib Dems. Well, of course, Richard Titus said there are going to be no deals, but of course, politics is a funny old game. Now, stand by for more from our world-exclusive interview with Donald Trump. And of course, he's been talking to Nigel Farage. And you don't want to miss what he's had to say about NATO. And we just had a sneak preview of it there. Farage spoke to us earlier. Donald Trump firing shots. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, British News Channel. First, your weather. This time, it is Aidan McGibbon. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Largely cloudy for the rest of the day, turning damp once again from the southwest, but it will stay mild in the south, although feeling colder further north. Now, we've seen a weather front pass through overnight last night. Next system coming along for overnight tonight with outbreaks of rain by the end of the afternoon, pushing into the southwest of England, Wales, and then across many central and southern parts of England before turning up by midnight into Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland, and Northern England. It does turn drier in the far south and southeast, although rather cloudy, 10 Celsius here by dawn colder and clearer for the far northwest of Scotland, a touch of frost possible. But in between, a lot of cloud cover, outbreaks of rain. Some of this will be heavy across parts of Wales and northern England. The rain does tend to peter out through the morning. It turns more showery, I think, by the afternoon. But it does linger there across northern England into Wales and parts of the southwest. The far southeast stays dry with some bright spells and highs of 18 Celsius. Much fresher for Scotland and Northern Ireland. After early rain, it does clear up and uh, there will be some sunshine, but temperatures will reach 9 or 10 Celsius. A wetter and windier day to come for Scotland and Northern Ireland on Thursday. That rain pushing into the far northwest of England and Wales by the end of the day, but staying dry in the south and southeast. Friday's a very showery day and it also turns colder later this week. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
a very good afternoon to you. It's 5 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, we've got our world-exclusive interview with Donald Trump, and you would not want to miss what he's had to say about NATO. Shots fired. Stand by for that. And it's yet another tough day for that man, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister. Some of his fellow Tory MPs are looking to replace him. Once again, surely we cannot have yet another change of Prime Minister. And according to some newspapers, we have a new James Bond. So, does Aaron Taylor-Johnson fit the 007 bill? Well, I'll be asking a former Bond girl. And that's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show. We've had a cracker so far and we've still got a wonderful hour to go. Now, um, Nigel Farage has been with Donald Trump in Florida at his place. We had him on the show a minute ago, poolside, and it seems an epic interview has occurred. The full interview will go out 7 o'clock tonight on the Nigel Farage show. We've got a sneak preview of what Trump had to say about NATO. And as Nigel Farage said, if you thought Trump version one was fireworks, you wait for Trump version two. If he gets back into the White House on November the 5th, fireworks surely will be launched. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Thanks very much indeed, Martin. Good evening to you. Well, our top story tonight, as you were hearing there from Martin, the former US President Donald Trump, has fired a warning shot at NATO members saying it is time to pay up. In a GB News World exclusive interview, he spoke to Nigel Farage and sent a clear message to NATO member countries. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this back in 2017 and 18 when you were president. You visited Brussels. You said it again recently. You made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Yeah. That's now being that's, used. Yeah, well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money, and the United States was paying for most of NATO. And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stopped paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. Yeah. I don't know if you know, but a lot yeah. of money's come in since those comments were made. Well, you can see that full interview with the former US President Donald Trump on Farage tonight from 7 o'clock right here on GB News. The first person to be convicted of cyber flashing in England and Wales has been jailed today for 66 weeks. 39-year-old Nicholas Hawkes sent unsolicited, explicit photographs to a teenager and a woman. The Justice Secretary described the offence as a distressing crime, which can't be normalised, and said the sentence sends a clear message that the behaviour has severe consequences. Four people have been hurt, and a dog believed to be an XL bully has had to be shot by police in South London. And a warning for viewers, the following does contain some distressing content. Let's show you this video footage captured of the attack that happened in Battersea just after 10 o'clock last night. A group of people desperately trying, if you're watching on television, you can see, trying to stop that dog. One person throwing a blanket over it to try to stop it. The four victims were taken to hospital for treatment for non-life-threatening injuries. The Met Police saying a 22-year-old man and a 21-year-old woman woman have been arrested on suspicion of being the owner of a dog dangerously out of control. Hundreds of jobs could be at risk as high street fashion retailer Ted Baker is set to be put into administration. Authentic Brands Group, Ted Baker's brand owner, says damage done during a tie-up with another firm was just too much to overcome. The No Ordinary Designer label company, which trades as Ted Baker, walked away from the deal in January after it claimed its partner had failed to meet its promise to inject cash into the business. Ted Baker has over 900 employees and 46 stores in the UK. 
Britain faces a 1979 moment, the Shadow Chancellor will say in a speech tonight, as Labour seeks to bring about a new chapter in Britain's economic history. Addressing finance leaders this evening, Rachel Reeves is understood to be likening the challenge awaiting the next government to that faced by Margaret Thatcher. She's made it clear she plans to reform the Treasury if Labour wins the general election. The Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Darren Jones, outlined her plan. We are on the cusp of an opportunity in this country, an opportunity for a decade of national renewal where we can get growth back into our economy, make people better off um, and start to turn the page on 14 years of failure from the Conservatives. If Labour is to win the election later this year, uh, it will be the worst fiscal inheritance that any party's had since the Second World War. And that's why we talk about a decade of national renewal. There will be some things we can do immediately and public services are obviously one of our priorities. The First Minister of Wales has delivered his resignation speech after facing questions in the Senate for the final time today. He says he's now looking forward to life on the back benches. Mark Drakeford, who's stepping down after five years in the job, was emotional as he talked about how difficult last year has been. For me personally, the last 12 months has been the hardest and the saddest of my life. And People will not see beyond the chamber those small acts of kindness that happen every day from people in every part of this chamber that help someone to get through those very, very difficult times. Mark Drakeford speaking there from earlier on. Now, Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A report found just 47% of local road miles were being rated as good, 36 were adequate and 17% poor. The Asphalt Industry Alliance says councils were expected to fix 2 million potholes in the current financial year. That's up 43% on the previous year and the highest annual total since 2015 to 16. And today, the Prince of Wales has been visiting a housing initiative in Sheffield to promote his homelessness project. The future king spoke to landlords and local authorities to see how his homewards venture could help ease pressure on councils. The outing comes after The Sun published pictures and a video of Prince William with his wife, the Princess of Wales, at a farm shop in Windsor on Saturday, following weeks of social media speculation surrounding the health and even the whereabouts of Princess Catherine. For the very latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Superb stuff. Now, of course, there's only one place to start, and that's with our huge or even huge interview with the former US president, Donald Trump, and he's, he's fired a warning shot at NATO, saying it's time to pay. In a GB News exclusive, Trump spoke to Nigel Farage, and he sent a clear message to member countries. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%, pay. and they you said pay. this back in 2017 and 18 when you were president, you visited Brussels, you said it again recently, you made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Well, that's now being that's, used. Yeah, well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. Yeah. I don't know if you know, but a lot yeah. of money's come in since those comments were made. Yeah. So NATO was not paying. And I said, well, the United States, they take advantage of the U.S. on trade like crazy, you know, as bad as almost anybody. And then on top of it, the NATO were largely similar countries, the same countries. NATO, they weren't paying their bills. And I went to the first meeting and I saw that. I didn't want to do it my first meeting. I just got there. But I went to the first meeting early in my administration and I saw what was going on. And I said, you're going to have to pay your bills, everybody. And the second meeting, I hit them hard. And uh, the question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, mm -hmm. including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? 
I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope, I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. And hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? Well, there we go. Shots fired. And indeed, I spoke to Nigel Farage around 30 minutes ago, and here's his take on Trump's warning shot to NATO chiefs. It was huge. You see, he made this comment at a rally a few weeks ago where he said, look, you know, if people don't pay the 2 percent, if people don't pay the membership fee, then Russia can just do what the hell it likes. That has been taken by all those in favour of the European Union, all the globalists, and they've all said, you know, from people like Malcolm Rifkin, the, the former foreign secretary, right the way through, and people are saying, ah, right, so if Trump wins, America pull out of NATO, so we must have a full European Defence Union, some even talking about the EU having its own nuclear weapons. Uh, and I was so worried about this. If there was one thing I wanted to get from this interview, it was a clear, definitive answer from Trump. Trump on where he really stood on NATO, and in particular, American leadership of it. And he's absolutely clear that when he makes those comments, they are a negotiating tactic. That's what he does. Read the book, The Art of the Deal. It's all there. But I asked him, you know, what would happen if Poland was invaded? And he said, look, he said, provided everyone's paid their money, we are with you 100 percent. And I hope that puts to bed some of these ridiculous stories that have been put out. Uh, and I hope we have a much deeper think ourselves about the extent to which we are getting involved with European defence treaties. Well, it's an absolutely fascinating encounter. And Donald Trump's also warned Prince Harry that he could be kicked out of America if he becomes the president of America again. And Harry is being investigated of whether he lied, of course, in his visa application after admitting in his autobiography Spare that he'd previously taken drugs. And Trump spoke to Nigel Farage about Harry and Meghan's behaviour affected the late Queen. Uh, she, you know, I would say, although she wouldn't show it because she was strong and smart, mm. but I would imagine they broke her heart. The things that they were saying were so bad and so horrible. And uh, she was in her 90s and hearing this stuff. I, I think they broke her heart. No, I it think, was horrible. I think they it really hurt her very but bad. But if he's, if he's lied on his visa form, yeah, doesn't, doesn't, know, doesn't the truth need to come out? We'll have I to. mean, should, should he get special privileges that nobody else does? No, and we'll have to see. Uh, if they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Mm, you would. But I thought they were very disrespectful to the family, to mm. the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I thought the Queen was incredible. I mean, think of it. All those years, 75 years, she, she's almost never made a mistake. Right. It's, it's, okay. it's almost unbelievable. And that's Donald Trump there pouring praise upon the late Queen and pouring scorn on Prince Harry. Believe me, you do not want to miss this interview. Nigel Farage's exclusive interview with Donald Trump will be live on GB News from 7 o'clock this evening, just under two hours' time. Do not miss it. Don't even put the kettle on. <laughs> now I'm joined in the studio by our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, let's just take some reaction to that. An extraordinary spectacle, if you think about it. And <laughs> what's fascinating about it, apart from the content, is that Donald Trump has been quite clear that he doesn't want to talk to other British media outlets, the Sky News, BBC. He's talking to GB News and without blowing our own trumpets, quite a moment. Yeah, it is a moment. It's the second big interview he's done, uh, Nigel Farage, I think. Um, I was struck by the, the close relationship between, clearly, Trump uh, and Farage. There's reports in the weekend, Mail Sunday, I thought was interesting about that... that Farage, you know, he's open to an idea of being a, a link person between yeah. the next government, Labour or Tory, and the Donald Trump administration. Um, in the old days, back in December 2016, I wrote stories for The Telegraph then when it was pretty clear some people in government wanted him to be the new UK ambassador to America to try and cement that, that kind of bond between and almost cement the special relationship between Trump and the Tories. Never came to pass, and likely to happen again. But I just wonder whether to hear, to hear Trump say to Farage, you, you have to tell me 
what mm. to do about um, Harry. Will he become an unofficial advisor mm. on the special relationship, almost a kind of person in the way of, of, that, of that kind of busy diplomatic lines between Washington and London? And that could be a real problem if that happens for London. I asked Nigel about that. I said there's been a lot of speculation about you being an interim, an ambassador, yeah. call it what you like, between the UK and the USA. And would Keir Starmer stand in the way of that? And I asked Nigel, what does um, Donald Trump make of Sir Keir Starmer? He said there's been absolutely no contact between no. the two regimes, not no. at all. I think there has been with Joe Biden's. I mean, that's quite normal, maybe. A, 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 um, a Democrat president does talk to, to Labour. Of course, we have seen how a Labour prime minister can get close to a Republican president. That happened with George W. Bush and Tony Blair, as we were discussing yeah. earlier with, uh, with John Rentoul. So it can happen, and often the requirements to make the special relationship work, which essentially is about intelligence, that's the big thing, forget everything else, it's intelligence, that supersedes egos and whether the two principles get on. Now, I asked Nigel... Um, if all of this meant that he would be getting a job with Trump and that might mean he won't be getting back involved with British policies. Of course, he kept his car oh, close goodness. to his chest, as you'd expect. But people ask a lot of emails on this topic, Chris. Um, reform polling at 14% today. We see a 26-point differential now between the Conservative Party and the Labour and Party. And a seven-point differential between the Reform and the Tory Party. And that's the one to watch, this idea of crossover you mentioned to Robert Hayward earlier. If that happens, what would it mean for Reform UK's polling? Would and would Reform... Crossover is when, the, when Reform becomes bigger than the Tory Party in the polls. Could that happen with uh, Nigel Farage getting back into the game again? And, of course, um, they might want um, Nigel Farage to stay in America if you're in the Conservative Party. Because once again, we're talking about leadership challenges. Now, Chris, um, you've got the scars, the T-shirts, everything. Oh. How many times are these stories touted about? But do you think this one might have some meat on the bones? Yeah, I didn't think so till this week. But ordinary people, uh, ordinary MPs, who aren't normally the, the troublemakers, are saying to me, this is going on. Last night, a meeting uh, of one of the so-called five tribes of, of the Tory right they met they spent 45 minutes not just anything to do with policy but whether Rishi Sunak should be replaced as their leader which is extraordinary open conversation 12 MPs um, on you know 2019 intake what they're looking at they're looking at this massive poll deficit nothing has moved it yeah. The efforts of, of, of the PM, Mr Sunak, he's had his conference speech in October, he had the King speech in early, early November, the autumn statement in November, the spring budget last week. Nothing is budging this, this almost set in stone, in hard cement, this 20-point lead for the Labour Party. So they have replaced a leader, they can do it again, that's a temptation. It might see, you can talk yourself into doing that, I think, in Westminster, but outside, I'm not sure what viewers and listeners think, I and mean, Robert Hayward thought it'd be ridiculous. If any model is the answer, what is the question? I mean, they, what they're asking, they, maybe it's, she can help beat, beat Labour. Labour do fear her, but some of her values are, are told, I think, with some members of the Tory party and certainly some on the right of the Tory party. Absolutely. And quickly, we covered earlier in the show yeah. the new hate speech laws being brought in on April the 1st. You couldn't make it <laughs> up. In Scotland, people can be um, prosecuted for telling the wrong kind of jokes. I believe you've got some information from us from Downing Street. That's right. I asked her the question of that in the um, 3.45 briefing with the PM's official, deputy official spokesman, she made very clear that this would not happen in England and Wales. Mm. This, this new uh, policy here in Scotland we talked about earlier with that, with that comedian and with Tony in, in north of the border, it would have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. Richard Sunak has made it very clear it is not thing in the Wales. So it would seem that Scotland will be an outlier for these hate crime Incidents, and I get J.K. Rowling has spoken out today, saying that she will continue to call trans women who are biological men men, and yeah. she said, "Come and get me if you want." So that's certainly going to be one to watch. Chris Hope, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us in the studio. Now you get lots more from our world exclusive interview with Donald Trump on our website, and thanks to you, GBNews.com is the fastest growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all of the brilliant analysis you've come to expect from GB News. Now, it's time now for the great British giveaway. And we've got a shopping spree, a garden gadget bundle and 12,345 quid, one, two, three, four, five pounds in cash, tax free. And here's all the details that you need to get your claws on that wonga. 
time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and Privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Great stuff. Fill your boots. Now, still to come, Wales' First Minister has resigned from the Welsh Parliament and will look at Mark Drakeford's legacy. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, haven't well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the fence. Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained uh, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through, we've followed them, and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine, he's, he's, in, he's on his phone, um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, he's on the phone to the... the the sort of the emergency crew in panic thinking he's going to sink um so we could not just sit there and watch um he's absolutely terrified yeah poor bloke well done you do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad it is because although i do sympathize with them they are so red taped but surely sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel.
Welcome back. It's 5.24. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, later this hour, I'll be joined by a former Bond girl to talk about who's been touted as the man who'll be the next 007. Now, outgoing First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, has held his final First Minister's Question session at the Welsh Parliament today and formally resigned from his position. He's stepping down after five years in that job. And he's a man, who, of course, who isn't without his controversy. And let's cross now live to Cardiff, where we're joined by our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. Catherine, welcome to the show. We're just um, getting Catherine up on the line at the moment. It's going to ask her, uh, Catherine. So, um, Drakeford gave his final address, bowing out. What do you think will be his legacy? How will he be remembered? Yes, well, he was very popular here in Wales for a long time. This country, of course, had the most draconian COVID restrictions of them all, much, much stricter here in Wales than they are round the rest of the country. And I think that's his legacy more than anything. Uh, but his popularity, although the Welsh public um, appealed, appeared to go along with that, be quite happy with those restrictions, his popularity really has waned in the last few months. First, with the notoriously controversial 20 mile per hour in urban areas, which was brought in in September, is beginning to be enforced as of yesterday. Uh, many people bitterly upset about that. And also, of course, the farmers' protests that we've seen. But in um, Mark Drayford's resignation speech, um, he basically said he was a socialist through and through. He said that he tried to keep his promises to the people of Wales and also thinking about future generations. He said that to be progressive, you basically um, had to face opposition, that it wasn't easy. But referring to, like, the 20 miles per hour, he said that he thought, ultimately, people would look back and wonder what all the fuss had been about. He got quite emotional, too. Let's just take a little look at some of what he had to say. For me, personally, the last 12 months has been the hardest and the saddest of my life. And... People will not see beyond the chamber those small acts of kindness that happen every day from people in every part of this chamber that help someone to get through those very, very difficult times. It was a very difficult year for Mark Drakeford. His beloved wife passed away last year. He was and clearly does remain completely devastated by that. And something that really has struck me here in the Senate today is the difference really between the mood here and in Westminster. Of course, it's a day of farewells. It's a day of tr paying tributes, but they sit in a circle. It's all very civilised. There's only 60 of these um, members of the Senate. They all know each other. And I think that was brought home when um, the leader of the opposition, um, Andrew R.T. Davis of the Conservatives um, replied um, and in his uh, remarks he pointed out how kind Mark Drakeford had been to him when he'd been ill and in fact his voice broke as well. I don't think it's you could imagine a world in which Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer paid tribute to each other and both ended up in tears. But although the mood was uh, very respectful here, amongst the public in Cardiff, a little bit different. Let's look at what some uh, voters had to say to me a bit earlier. No, sorry. You don't? No. He was too personal. It was all about what he believed. Uh, and I don't think that that's what the majority of the people believe. Um, in the beginning, yes. But later on, I would say no. What? No, terrible job. Why is that? Absolutely. Uh, well, everything he's touched has turned to rubbish. Health, education, road transport, rail transport. Do I need to go on? I mean, it's all worse. It, compared to all the other UK countries, it's dropped from middle of the league to the bottom of the league. I don't think he's done too much for the Welsh people. And the last thing with the 20 mile an hour limit, I think, was the last straw. He's a sweet man. He gives me my awards. 
Um, I think he had a really hard year last year and I feel really bad for him as a person. I hope he enjoys his retirement and he can enjoy as much as he can, given what was left. So some warm words there, but an awful lot of criticism too. Now, Mark Drakeford is uh, writing to the King now to give his formal resignation. Then tomorrow, um, his successor, Vaughan Gething, will become the first uh, Minister of Wales and the first black person to lead a European nation. That will be quite a moment worth saying. He is not without controversy either because there's the issue of a £200,000 donation uh, which came to his campaign um, from a company where the boss had been um, criminally convicted twice of polluting that it's alleged he'd lobbied for previously. A lot of bad feeling here, a lot of demands to give that money back, um, although I don't think that's going to be happening. But we will bring you more on that tomorrow, Martin, here on GB News in Cardiff. Thank you very much, Catherine Force, uh, live there in Cardiff with the reaction to Mark Drakeford stepping down. Sounds like voters, a lot of voters you spoke to there will be hoping he leaves office a bit quicker than 20 miles an hour. Now, still to come, before 5pm, can vandalism ever be justified? Well, a court has ruled someone's political beliefs cannot be used to justify such actions. But first, it's time for your headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The top story is this hour. The former US President Donald Trump has fired a warning shot at NATO, saying it's time to pay. In a GB News exclusive, he spoke to Nigel Farage and sent a clear message to NATO member countries. Why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stopped paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks yeah. ago. Well, you can see that full interview on Farage tonight, right here on GB News from 7 o'clock. Hundreds of jobs could be at risk as high street fashion retailer Ted Baker is set to be put into administration. US owner Authentic Brands Group says damage done during a tie-up with another firm was too much to overcome. Ted Baker, Ted Baker rather, has over 900 employees and 46 stores in the UK. And the Prince of Wales has visited housing initiatives in Sheffield in Yorkshire to promote his homelessness project. The future king spoke to landlords and the local authorities to see how his venture could help ease pressure on local councils. The outing comes after The Sun published pictures and a video of Prince William with his wife, the Princess of Wales, at a farm shop in Windsor at the weekend. That follows weeks of speculation surrounding the health and even the whereabouts of Princess Catherine. Those are the headlines. For the very latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound buying you $1.2725 and €1.1715. The price of gold is £1,694.38 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 closed today at 7,738 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. Now, a court has ruled that protesters can't use their beliefs as a form of defence for vandalism. Well, human rights activist Peter Tatchell will give me his take on that. He's just joined me in the studio, in fact. I'm Martin Dorbley on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. 
Welcome back to Headliners. And, Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old-fashioned, traditional mail breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Rao, as hospitals say, hormone-filled milk from trans <laughs> women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because, you know, when hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. And I want to show you this hostel. This is... Whether it's necessary. The University yeah, let's Hostel do. Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences I have read God, aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yeah. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us at 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Earlier on Breakfast. The story is not about Kate. You know, I think the goodwill is known by the public that we wish her well and we're pleased to see her. I think this is about how badly the press office has handled this from Kensington Palace's point of view. Zero throughout this whole thing because the fake photo fiasco should not have happened if there had been good staff work. Illegal immigration down. We want to see uh, people not making that crossing and we do think that this bill uh, will be a significant deterrent for people uh, who would otherwise cross the channel. I have no faith in politicians, government, uh, to actually do anything at all now. I mean, it's, it's 11 years this year I've been campaigning. From six, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. 5.38, I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News. Before six o'clock, I'll be joined in the studio by a former Bond girl. After the next man set to play, the famous spy has today been identified. But before that, senior judges have confirmed the protesters do not gain a free pass to cause criminal damage on the basis of the belief that their victims support their cause. Now, judges have ruled that political beliefs and other motivations for protest are too remote to be a lawful excuse, whereas the time, place and extent of the damage and the fact that it occurred during a protest could be circumstances for a line of defence. Well, to make sense of that and to pick over it, joining me now in the studio is human rights campaign and activist Peter Tashiel. Peter, welcome to the studio. Always a pleasure to have you on the channel. What this ruling is trying to say, for example, if you believe that um, um, Colston was a slave driver and you decide to pull down the statue, um, that's not OK. Except, Peter, that's not what happened in the court of law. So at present, your political stance, in a sense, can get you off. Mm. Well, I think 
Normally, I would be opposed to any form of criminal damage. That's not the way, right way to do politics. But there may be some very limited circumstances where it may be morally justified. So, for example, some years ago, um, a group of protesters damaged um, UK airplanes that were destined to be sent to Indonesia to bomb the people of East Timor and West Papua. And they were acquitted because the jury ruled that the higher cause of international law and human rights overrode the damage they caused. And I, I think that was the right judgment. Equally, if a, a big industrial plant is polluting a local community, causing damage, particularly to young kids' health, if they won't listen to reason, if they won't stop, then I think you know, doing damage to that industrial plant to save children's health may be morally justified. But that law says none of that is justifiable, this new law, except, Peter, we still see <coughs> too much uh, ambiguity, too many grey areas, for example, around things like clambering on war memorials or spraying racist on the Winston Churchill statue just outside there at Parliament Square. They're not just statues, are they? They, are, they aren't just things. They have a resonance. Mm. And maybe that's why they're targeted. And so, therefore, maybe this new ruling is long overdue. It should take political views, excuses away. And should it go further and take those views into account? If you specifically target something because you know it will cause extreme offence, like Churchill, like the Cenotaph, maybe that should be its own special offence. Well, I think you're right that people have to be very careful about how they protest. The methods they use that has to be really carefully calibrated and, you know, doing something that's going to be grossly offensive is not only putting them in the firing line, but it's actually going to be counterproductive because people won't listen to their point of view if they do outrageous things like desecrating war memorials. That, that's wrong, that's wrong. Yeah. But, and here's the big but, I think it is right that people's intention and motives are taken into consideration. You know, um, Gandhi and Martin Luther King both committed peaceful, non-violent acts, um, as have I, uh, entirely peaceful and non-violently, but against the law. And like them, I was always willing to take the consequences. I believed about something so strongly that I was prepared to get arrested, get convicted, and if necessary, go to prison. To make your point, I yeah. was seeing on screen there, Peter, images of Just Stop Oil protesters slashing up paintings, smashing glass. We saw them chiselling the fronts of banks in the city, causing huge amounts of financial and criminal damage. They got away with it for a long time, but then they clamped down. And guess what? The Just Stop Oil protest basically just got stopped when the law came down. So. Yeah. Clearly, there is public appetite to clamp down on this kind of stuff. Well, I'm not too sure exactly what the public think, because I think a lot of people would, would object. Well, just but, the void have surely but, lost the room. But, 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 but just think about this. NASA's projections on climate destruction suggest that by about 2050, or maybe even a bit earlier, large parts of London will flood well, due to sea level well, rises that, and storm that's, surges. That's a separate point. The, the, the point we're talking about here is, irrespective of what you may believe, mm. irrespective of, of the cause, the outcomes, this new rule says it's not cricket to yeah. go around vandalising things because yeah. you want to make a political point. That's what this is saying. Yeah, I accept that's what they're saying, but I'm questioning whether it is right, the right judgement because, you know, large parts of most of East London and South London are going to be regularly underwater. People are going to lose their homes, their jobs, that's the a, area... That, the that's a doomsday scenario. Well, and they've been, you know, don't forget, in the 1970s, it was going to be a constant ice age. Yeah, well, I sort of respect NASA. They're, they're a pretty respected, scientific-grounded uh, institution. They are warning that we need to take action, otherwise these could be the consequences. And other British cities are going to follow similar, similar problems. So, so back to Just Stop Oil, because that, yeah. that's tangible, people can get yeah. that. Do you think it's acceptable to smash up paintings, slash up paintings of former prime ministers because you think fossil fuels are a bad thing? Or is this rule right? That should stop. Well, I wouldn't do it. But I look hard back to the suffragettes. The suffragettes are held as heroes now, but they did all of those things. Well, they put and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're lauded, lauded today. Now, you know, what we think now is wrong may, in hindsight, not be seen as so wrong, given the positive changes that some forms of protest have, have achieved. And I'd say this, you know, yes, under no circumstances does anyone do criminal damage willfully or negligently without good, really strong reasons. But if you do it, 
you have to be prepared to take the consequences, which I've always done in my protest. When I've broken the law, I've said, OK, I've broken the law, I'm prepared to go to prison. Good. OK, well, th th thanks for coming in, Pete Statchell. Fabulous points, well made, great to have you in the studio. Now, still to come, some newspapers are reporting that we have a new James Bond. So does Aaron Taylor-Johnson fit the 007? Well, to find out, I'm about to ask a former Bond girl who joined me in the studio. Looking forward to that. I'm Martin Dorby on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Largely cloudy for the rest of today, turning damp once again from the southwest, but it will stay mild in the south, although feeling colder further north. Now, we've seen a weather front pass through overnight last night. Next system coming along for overnight tonight with outbreaks of rain by the end of the afternoon, pushing into the southwest of England, Wales, and then across many central and southern parts of England before turning up by midnight into Northern Ireland, southern Scotland and northern England. It does turn drier in the far south and southeast, although rather cloudy, 10 Celsius here by dawn, colder and clearer for the far northwest of Scotland, a touch of frost possible. But in between, a lot of cloud cover, outbreaks of rain. Some of this will be heavy across parts of Wales and northern England. The rain does tend to peter out through the morning. It turns more showery, I think, by the afternoon. But it does linger there across northern England into Wales and parts of the southwest. The far southeast stays dry with some bright spells and highs of 18 Celsius. Much fresher for Scotland and Northern Ireland. After early rain, it does clear up and uh, there will be some sunshine, but temperatures will reach 9 or 10 Celsius. A wetter and windier day to come for Scotland and Northern Ireland on Thursday. That rain pushing into the far northwest of England and Wales by the end of the day, but staying dry in the south and southeast. Friday's a very showery day and it also turns colder later this week. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live, here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions, when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live, here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Brand new Sundays from 6 p.m. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6 p.m. on GB News. Now, the name's Daubney, Martin Daubney, oh. licensed to present a TV show. That got a laugh, if nothing else. <laughs> and one of the big stories today is that it looks like the new James Bond has finally been identified. Apparently, it's Aaron Taylor-Johnson. The 33-year-old British star is reportedly set to replace Daniel Craig as the next actor to play the fictional spy as Craig hung up that famous 007 cloak. And I'm joined now by another former Bond girl, Madeline Smith. And she was in Live and Let Die alongside the legend Roger Moore and also Jane Seymour. Welcome to the studio 
Absolute Thank pleasure. Thank you darling. so much. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. A pleasure to be here. Now then, yes, you've been up close, and it's fair to say. I have been personal. in bed with, yes. You've been in bed with Roger Moore. Yes. Um, we got that one out of the way. Um, how do you think the new fella stacks up? Has he got what it takes? I think he's a beautiful-looking man. Mm. He's got something that dear Roger didn't have, which is an air of danger. Mm. He's got that, that narrowed-eyed look. The thing about darling Roger was he, he, he never wanted confrontation in real life or indeed in film. Mm. And, uh, and I think may, maybe that's just one little tiny element against, against his bond. Mm. Maybe, maybe. Uh, he had such a pleasant face and such a pleasant personality. Uh, this guy looks like he could be trouble. Mm. And I think Bond needs to have that edge, which Sean had. Yeah, you were saying um, before we came on yeah. that Sean Connery, who, by the way, full disclosure, was my favourite James Bond. Yes, and many, yeah. many, a, many a lady went for him. Rough yeah. at the edges, unreconstructed, unre politically incorrect. Yes. For many, that was the golden era of James Bond. Do you yeah. think it's that the franchise has become a little bit too PC? It's because everything has become too PC, but we're, we're, we're in an era now where we're finding the level, I think. Uh, we, we, it, it'll, it'll, it'll come right yes. in the end. What I do feel is that we do need a little more humour again, yes. but not too much, not too many jokes, not a joke a minute. Mm -hmm. I think, if anything, dear Roger, even in real life and sometimes the, some of the talks that he gave, he did uh, revert, I think, perhaps shyness. Yeah. to uh, the laughter and making people laugh and the jokes. We don't want a jokey bond. No. We want a serious bond, but within the script we need humour. For example, um, in, in my lovely little scene, uh, well, not, not my bit, but uh, Bernard Lee with the coffee, the look on his face, the way that he looks at Bond, perfect. That's what you need. Just those little edges. And Very course, subtle. And, of course, Roger Moore could say a thousand things by simply raising an eyebrow. Oh, he was brilliant at that. But he, he was... <laughs> he, Roger was actually a comic turn. I mean, mm. off-camera, I mean, we, we shrieked together. We danced around and did the tango on the bed. We romped quite a lot in the bed, except that, unfortunately, his wife was at the foot of the bed, which slightly spoilt the occasion. I, I can imagine. His real-life yeah. wife. Mm -hmm. Well, As opposed to Miss During Carrizo. the filming? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. She was on standby. She stand was at the bottom of the... No, not on standby. She was actually at the foot of the bed staring at every move we made. Was that to make sure that it was yes, just quite. acting? Yeah, well, we both had knickers on. Yeah. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. No, you're not. Carry on. I, I had a sort of nappy thing on, which was far from sexy. <laughs> it looked like I was off to the skating rink. And he had, I remember, blue boxer shorts. Very nice. We were very... Um, Decorous. See, I think it's it's a great thing. Um, this is just me. Yeah. That the new Bond is an English bloke. I I just think it's faithful to the novels. Um, Fleming himself also said that he was in his mid thirties. Yes, James correct. Bond, especially in Moonraker, he identified him as thirty seven. So in that respect. This new fella ticks all the boxes. He does. He's 33. Yeah. He, he And also, I mean, he's rather an interesting fella. I like the fact that he's gone for the older woman. I find that very intriguing, as I'm not exactly a chicken anymore. <laughs> not a spring chicken, anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously, that be, all of it appeals to me. He's got a little bit of scandal behind him already. I think that's a bit scandalous. I think mm. that's great fun. And uh, I, I think that he will appeal enormously to the ladies. And he's got a fantastic physique. And that's not a bad thing. Not no, a bad thing. Uh, has, he, not. has he got a hairy chest? I think. I think he has. Because I, I, I think. I don't actually personally remember his chest, but uh, I like a hairy chest on a bloke. They don't have to be smooth. I don't, and if he has a hairy chest, please, please don't shave it. Yeah. Well, you, you that is instructions. You don't like all that sort of pluck chicken look. You, no, I don't. Yeah. No, I don't. I like a man to look like a bloke. Yeah, and I think, actually, that is what the franchise is also missing. You know, that kind of slightly rough at the edges, unreconstructed, devil-may-care attitude. Definitely. Not... And a little bit of a pushover. I mean, so what if, if the women get pushed over a little bit? Some women, maybe me, quite like to be pushed over a little bit. I, I personally, women are going to loathe me for this, but I like a man to be masterful. Yeah, and I think... Afraid so. That is a great place to leave it. I think a lot of people will, will concur with that. I really do, Madeline. Mm. The people want to see a return to a fun franchise that's yes. not politically correct and stop sapping the fun out of it and give the audience yes. what they want. It's make-believe. Yeah. And Can Bond we was, remember? Bond was never perfect and we should nope. celebrate those imperfections.
Thank you, my love. Pleasure. Thanks for having... Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Madeline Smith, former Bond girl. Absolutely pleasure way to end the show. Now, I've got a few of your emails. Of course, you've been getting in touch in your droves on that topic. At 7 o'clock, Nigel Farage, that exclusive with Donald Trump from Florida. And um, Eric says this, not Eric Trump. Eric, if Trump manages to get re-elected, he will turn the US inwards and begin an isolationist policy. Fair to say he's not a fan. And on the issue of William and Kate, Anthony says, this. It wouldn't surprise me that both William and Kate are having a good old laugh at the gormless individuals who are making such a fuss about this whole thing. And indeed, you know, so many have got in touch saying, just leave them alone. Let them enjoy their privacy and get well soon. Thanks for joining me on the show today. It's been superb. Jubin Co is after this, six till seven. Your weather first with Aidan McGiven. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Largely cloudy for the rest of the day, turning damp once again from the southwest, but it will stay mild in the south, although feeling colder further north. Now, we've seen a weather front pass through overnight last night. Next system coming along for overnight tonight with outbreaks of rain by the end of the afternoon pushing into the southwest of England, Wales and then across many central and southern parts of England before turning up by midnight into Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland and Northern England. It does turn drier in the far south and southeast although rather cloudy, 10 Celsius here by dawn, colder and clearer for the far northwest of Scotland, a touch of frost possible. But in between, a lot of cloud cover, outbreaks of rain. Some of this will be heavy across parts of Wales and northern England. The rain does tend to peter out through the morning. It turns more showery, I think, by the afternoon. But it does linger there across northern England into Wales and parts of the southwest. The far southeast stays dry with some bright spells and highs of 18 Celsius. Much fresher for Scotland and Northern Ireland. After early rain, it does clear up and uh, there will be some sunshine, but temperatures will reach 9 or 10 Celsius. A wetter and windier day to come for Scotland and Northern Ireland on Thursday. That rain pushing into the far northwest of England and Wales by the end of the day, but staying dry in the south and southeast. Friday is a very showery day and it also turns colder later this week. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the